Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'll call the meeting to order. The first uh, item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. The first uh, item I have is that we have some agenda changes for today's meetings, and I want to report those out to start. First, we'll be adding, uh, actually switching the timing of the wait times update. It's currently on the afternoon agenda, and we're now moving it to after the insurer's presentation this morning. So it'll probably start around 11. Um, so I wanted to alert folks to that. The next change on the agenda is that we will be um, Sorry, my dogs are coming in. Um, we will be taking an item off of the, well, there will still be an item on the agenda. I was informed late yesterday that the Department of Mental Health will not be attending the meeting today. They have uh, submitted some written comments in lieu of their in-person appearance. So uh, the, the board may want to still discuss those comments and um, have questions for the Department of Mental Health. We have invited them back to um, present and share their work with the board, and that hopefully will happen next month. And those are the two agenda items. Are there any questions uh, on that from the board? So. Do we have that uh, letter from the Department of Mental Health posted on the website? We do, Mr. Chair. Yes, that is under today's materials, and I believe it's present. It's posted on what, under what's new as well, so folks can get that handily. Okay, Thank great. You. Um, the other items I have are two public comments. So there is a public comment that I've been um, reporting out for. Uh, almost a year now, actually over a year now, that the board is accepting public comments on a potential next agreement with our federal partners at CMMI on an all-payer model agreement. Uh, any of our comments we share with our partners at the Department, at the Agency of Human Services and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on the next potential model. I also want to remind folks that the Department of Financial, Departments of Financial Regulation and uh, the Vermont Health Access have uh, prepared materials uh, or prepared materials and presented those materials on the new EHB benchmark plan. Um, and they, they have a, a link to um, that, those materials as uh, on the Department of Financial Regulation website. And so if folks want to comment, please, click on our link under public comments and it'll direct you over to the Department of Financial Regulation website. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention and alert folks to is that on our website, we've posted the Department of Human Resources posting for the new board chair as well as uh, board vacancies. And so if you have questions on that, um, you would want to direct them to the Department of Human Resources as they run the recruitment through the GMCB nominating committee. And that is all I have to report, Chair Mullen. I'll turn it back to you. Super. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, April 20th. Is there a motion? So moved. I'm moved. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, April 20, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. So now we're going to go right into um, the main topic of uh, discussion this morning which is an update from Blue Cross and MVP on payment reform efforts and general updates. So um, I'll turn it over to the two insurance companies. Sarah, were you going to moderate this?
I think Sarah was going first, right, Sarah, and then and then MVP and then MVP after you. Oops. Awesome, Booth Field of Vermont, and with me I have um, Grace Gilbert Davis and uh, Lou McLaren. And Grace is actually going to kick off the presentation and pull up the slide deck, I believe. <coughs> I wasn't sure if I was opening um, bringing up the slide deck. Hmm. Apologies, folks. I'm not used to working in on this platform. And there it is. And we can see it. And there it is. Great. Okay. Now, let's see if we can't make this a little bigger. Can you all see it? Hey, Grace, yes. can we put it into presentation mode? Yeah, I'm trying to do that, Lou. Uh, Okay. Are we good now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, good morning, Chair Mullen, Member Holmes, Member Pelham, Member Walsh, Green Mountain Care Board staff, and community members. Uh, my name is Grace Gilbert Davis, and in my role as Corporate Director for Healthcare Reform and Quality, I am responsible for aligning Blue Cross's value based work with One Care Vermont our network providers, and our community partners. And I need to move to my next slide. Our agenda, today's agenda speaks to um, the Green Mountain Care Board's questions about Blue Cross of Vermont's efforts to support the all-payer model through our long-standing collaboration with One Care Vermont, our growing value-based programming developed by Vermonters for Vermonters, our understanding of the impediments we faced in our reform work, and our innovative cost containment achievements, past, present, and future. And I apologize, I am having some challenges with advancing slides. If someone could provide me with some guidance as to how to advance. Oh. Okay, next. Slide, thank you. Um, we'd like to start um, by sharing our healthcare reform um, philosophy. Um, we truly believe that we can only achieve reform by partnering with our providers and, and stakeholders, um, because only by working with people on the front lines of healthcare can we truly achieve our goals to approve clinical outcomes, reduce the cost of care for our members and employers, and maintain exemplary member experience. And we achieve these goals by developing value-based payment models through our partnerships with OneCare, with providers and stakeholders that are straightforward in design and, and implementation. I just want to tell you, this is Sarah, I think I'm controlling the slides. So tell me when you want to advance. I apologize. <laughs> I, I said, good to know. Okay. Um, so our collaboration um, with OneCare began in the beginning. 
we were the um, single commercial payer with OneCare until 2020. Uh, roughly 70% of Blue Cross providers contract with, with OneCare. And our contribution to uh, member attribution has grown annually from roughly 30,000 plus in 2018 to more than double that number or 62,445 in 2022. Next slide, please, Sarah. That's the right one, Grace. I'm having a problem too. <laughs> everyone. Thank you, Sarah. So our long-standing shared risk and savings arrangements began in, in 2014 with shared savings programs um, through 2017. In 2018, we saw the introduction of shared risk and shared savings. With the advent of COVID, Blue Cross and One Care pivoted, agreeing to a capped shared risk savings agreement for QHP and primary. However, we did use the, the COVID years, right, between 2020 through 2022 to develop um, a fixed perspective payment pilot offered to Vermont hospitals and independent providers. More on that to come. Um, and we also developed a um, implemented, excuse me, an annual quality work plan um, in, in collaboration with OneCare. And as we um, plan, okay. I'm sorry, Sarah, can you please go back? Okay. Again, what remained a constant was our quality work our commitment to the 11 quality measures um, continued and even evolved when, again, as I mentioned, we developed an annual quality improvement plan that we hope to expand over time to include measures that support the healthcare needs of Vermonters. Um, there are ongoing lessons learned that have helped Blue Cross identify the challenges we face in our work with OneCare, and I will um, turn it over to Sarah to explain um, those challenges. Apologies for the slide uh, slowness. So um, I'll explain some of these now, and then we'll get into more specific um, with the program, but um, some of the impediments to success that we um, have experienced from the from the payer side are the slow growth in attribution. And I think what you've seen and you all know is that many um, of providers are participating in the Medicaid program, but have been slower to um, to participate in the commercial program. Um, the next, and this is um, very important for us, is that it ex excludes retail pharmacy. Um, and as you know, and as we discuss often, um, pharmacy is a major cost driver um, of premiums and an area of concern for us. So this is one we'd like to continue exploring. Um, the third, the lack of actionable reporting and analysis for providers of Blue Cross, um, what we've heard from providers, but also we see when we um, view the data is that it's hard for us to, um, the data is sometimes delayed um, and sometimes not detailed enough for us to, um, to really use it in a way to help providers and to work on um, cost containment initiatives and care coordination. Um, and then that leads into the lack of clarity around the care coordination role. So I think You've all heard some of the discussion here, and there's um, a difference between um, panel management and care coordination um, and, and some other um, tools that are being used. And so just making sure that we work together to make sure to, so that everyone's on the same page and working on um, aligning our priorities and our actions, it would be important. Did I miss anything, Grace? Oh, you did not, Sarah. Okay. So 
Um, the next one we want to talk specifically about is the fixed prospective payment pilot with Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and a few, a handful of, more than a handful of primary care practices. So um, in 2019, One Care Vermont approached us about developing a fixed prospective payment pilot. Um, it's considered a critical step in the development of the all-payer model and a number of hospitals um, we're considering the program was our understanding. This was clearly pre-COVID. Um, ultimately, only one hospital um, chose to participate. Um, and the pilot began in April of 2020. So that's definitely unfortunate timing. Um, and the payments are for our qualified health plan lives only, which is a fairly small number in the 15,000 attributed range. Um, and then also in 2021, we added um, 11 independent primary care practices. So it's been good for us to be able to see how this works with a hospital provider and then also with independent primary care providers since um, there's different um, approaches with each of those. Um, I, should, I should have said right up front, front that um, we are the first pair to enter into one of these fixed prospective payment contracts. It's not a true fixed FPP. Um, we do reconcile at the end of the year to claims. So, um, but it was important for us to, um, to start out as a pilot and, and see what we needed to do. Um, I think the one other thing um, I wanted to talk about on this slide and the reason we have the diagram um, with the triangle in the corner is that it's a three-party relationship, but we're not all um, participating in all three parts of the relationship simultaneously. So um, we maintain our typical contractual relationships with the provider for the delivery of care, um, negotiating the rates on fixed prospective payments. Um, and then One Care Vermont is maintaining the provider agreements with the ACO and the provider. So for the fixed prospective payments. So there are some um, areas in the contract and the relationship that we don't have a clear um, transparent vision into. Um, and then what we do at the end is true up to the claims. Um, and that's the same for both the hospital and the independent practices. Um, so I'm gonna move to the next slide. So it's shared responsibilities by all three parties. And then this was to give you some information about what we've learned and what we um, believe we need to do more of going forward. So the pilot really did allow all parties to test the implementation of just the operations. So system development, um, IT changes, actuarial analysis. There's a lot of um, work behind the scenes that needs to happen in order to make these um, line up and work together. So a, a lot of that was, was good that we had a pilot so we could work on those things. Um, I think I'll jump to the, the fourth bullet here. So, so currently um, we do see some problems in the way that it's operating. Um, and I think with some you know, time and, and investment, we could get over those hurdles. Um, they are operational and we believe that we could fix those. Um, it does at this time, however, seem like a significant commitment for such a small membership. Um, we're only doing it with um, one hospital and, and a, a few primary care practices. It's a little, it, it's outside of the scope of how we operate. Um, and then, um, let's see. One second. Uh, I, I don't think I need to say it, but but having this pilot begin during COVID also, um, I think everyone was distracted, um, at least for the first year, uh, with uh, numerous other things. And this wasn't the highest priority project, at least for the first year. So that's been, um, I think, one of the difficulties with this as well. Um, another thing is that we really need to see, and I, you know, Grace talked a little bit about our healthcare reform philosophy. She'll talk about that tenants later. Um, we need to see benefits from these programs for our members um, when we commit the time and resources into them. And there's no clear um, distinction between the fixed prospective payment program and other programs through One Care Vermont, say, and the quality and the financial benefits. So that's one thing that we would like to see more of going forward. Um, and the last piece, um, and I think you all know this, but fixed prospective payment in isolation, we don't really believe can drive system reform. 
Um, it really needs to be paired with other, other efforts in order to see success. Um, and things like that are the internal financial incentives at the provider practices. We feel that, that those need to also align with the fixed perspective payments. Um, and there's still a lot in our system that's geared towards fee-for-service. Um, and the, the, um, the last, I had one last thought. Um, <laughs> the, the last thought we had on this is um, we really do see this as a way to move forward. Um, and, and the risk is another big part of this. Um, we believe that the providers are still um, hesitant, um, partly because of what's just happened over the last two years. And we really haven't returned to a stable system, as you've seen. And so that is another thing that really is holding us back. And I know that we want to be set up to move forward as soon as we feel that, that it's the right time. Um, but One Care Vermont really needs to work with the providers and let us know when it is the right time to take on more of these projects and um, move away from the reconciliation piece. So I am, I believe, Lou is starting on this one. I am. Thank you. I'm Lou McLaren, and I'm the Director of Provider Services at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Grace started off our presentation talking about our health care reform philosophy. Um, it's really setting up the, the overarching approach that we want to take in our health care reform efforts. These three tenants really there are beliefs on how our reform efforts need to move forward and how they're actually operationalized. And I think it's probably important to let you know that um, healthcare reform activities don't just sort of come out of the provider contracting arena. We get ideas and think about opportunities and discuss and share them. Providers come to us with ideas. Um, there may be some activities or, or ideas for programs that arise through our utilization management teams or our integrated health teams, care coordination. But no matter where the source of the idea or the program comes, we have to focus on these three tenets. We need to be able to feel with a high degree of confidence that a pilot that we develop or a program that we're planning to implement can deliver on benefits to the members and the employers. Um, and really that's measured through cost savings, premium uh, reductions, or you know the quality, the focus on quality, which is the second tenant. Quality can be super big to, to wrap your arms around. And we need to be able to drill down to quality measures and activities that have meaning that you can actually show deliver. You know, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can see it, you can measure it, and you can take action on it. Historically, I don't know that we've collectively as a healthcare system been able to accomplish that successfully, but we've really come to believe very strongly at Blue Cross that it has to be a lot easier than maybe we've made it in the past. And the final thing is really the data integrity. It may be something that's not particularly um, discussed with great regularity, but Moving to any sort of a global budget or fixed perspective payment, it doesn't mean that you leave the world of submitting claims or, or capturing the data around the care that's delivered because you need those data and you need all of those data points in order to do the measurements that we're talking about in number two as our second tenant. So we can't lose sight of the data collection and how important it is to be able to demonstrate the success of our programs. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, Sarah? Oops, back one. <laughs> this is a very sensitive pro program, it looks like. I'd like to talk to you and, and really to share and to boast about some of the current programs that we have in place here with Blue Cross. And um, I think what's important to recognize is that the programs I'm going to share with you, they really span the spectrum of providers. So we have programs that are uh, with a hospital. We have programs with designated agencies. We have programs with the home health agencies, mental health and substance use disorder providers and um, 
sort of the last bullet is really a compilation of provider types that I'll talk about. But the, the first, the in-home program for mental health services, this is a new and really innovative pilot that we have. It started with the Howard Center. It now includes HCRS, and we're looking to expand it to additional designated agencies. This is a program that's targeting children and youth who are at a crossroads in their care. We're either trying to keep them out of a higher level of care, like uh, being in a, a, a down at the brow of our retreat, or maybe they're coming down from a higher level of care and they can't quite transition fully to outpatient therapy, that they need something that's got a little more scaffolding around it. And so this is a program where um, it's a bundled monthly rate and it provides assessments, enhanced care coordination, and um, supportive counseling for these children. It's been an exciting program for us to enter into with these two designated agencies. It's really filling a niche that we are recognizing, and I think that all of the conversations that have taken place over the past few years around the need for better access to mental health and substance use disorder, particularly for the child and adolescent population. You know, we're trying to find a way to provide the care that's needed, recognizing the limitations that we have in access in the system in general. This it, During COVID, obviously, some of this was not in home, but it was done remotely. So it, it has that adaptability and can certainly flex with the patient's needs. The second program we have in place, this is a hospital program. It's a shared savings program where we have a, two bundled rates for your the two levels of colonoscopy. We've um, entered into the agreement. It's been in place for probably about three or four years now, and it has produced shared savings that we do share with the facility. It's something that we want to expand across the state, um, and it really lends itself to being a bundled service. This is a high-volume service that in many ways could almost be considered a commodity. If any of you have had a colonoscopy, your experience may be that you and your primary care provider have identified that it's time for you to have one, and you, you really just make the appointment. You don't necessarily meet with the surgeon beforehand. So it, it is something that, as far as surgery is concerned, it is a relatively simple, low-risk surgery that we think is a really good way to demonstrate opportunities to work with our hospital partners to develop a shared savings program. The third program we have in place, this is pretty unusual. Um, this is a quality-based performance uh, program that we have with the home health agencies. And this design with them, it was around two tiers of reimbursement. And it was what we call a gate and ladder approach. There were some baseline quality measures that the agencies needed to meet or exceed, and that got them through the gate. And then once they sort of qualified, there were then some additional quality metrics that um, were important both to the home health agencies and relevant to Blue Cross. Then they had performance targets in those measures as well. And we did find that there were um, a number of the agencies did qualify for the higher level reimbursement. Um, it's a program that's a tough. It's a tough for us because as a commercial payer, we are not the lion's share of um, the patient population that is being served by the VNAs, but we've still um, continued to work with them on how can we make it more meaningful and more robust for both parties, recognizing that probably the biggest limiting factor is the low volumes. The fourth program we have in place is called the Feedback Informed Treatment or FIT, and that is not to be confused with the FIT test that is used for colorectal cancer screening. It's unfortunate they have the same acronym, but I'm talking about something that's for mental health and substance use disorder care. This is working specifically with the outpatient therapist provider category. And it's a program where the providers are trained. It's, um, it takes a level of engagement on their part. And really what it is, is it's a, it's a program design that offers a continuous feedback mechanism between the client and the provider. And so really what it's measuring is, does the client perceive that there's advancement in their care? 
or not. And so that's an opportunity to do a mid-course adjustment to the treatment approach if, if the client's impression is it's not working. It also measures and takes a look at the client's perception of his or her relationship with the provider. So it's a, it's a highly engaged program for the providers that do participate in it. We provide the training, we provide the resources, and they are on enhanced fee schedule. Now, the success of patients who are treated by a fit provider or by providers who adopt the fit approach, you see a lower dropout rate in care. You see a lower rate of hospitalization, lower lengths of stay if you are hospitalized, um, a, a lower rate of deterioration in the disease state, and a lower total cost of care when compared to control groups. So it has been wildly successful sort of nationally in the body of literature, but we've also been able to determine that we've seen those successes with our Vermont population. And the final program I'd like to talk about, this is really exciting. This is a collaboration with the University of Vermont Medical Center. It's a non-invasive integrative pain clinic. It's a pain program that lasts 16 weeks. Um, and it encompasses a variety of services. It is not just physical medicine. It incorporates the mental health component of medicine. They're looking at you know, physical medicine visits, group and individual therapy treatments. But then you move on to the services that aren't standard benefits. There's the whole food and eating for health and the nutritional, nutritional counseling is a covered benefit, but learning how to cook in a way that's appropriate to help you treat your pain. Um, massage therapy, yoga, acupuncture, Reiki, mindfulness, all of these services are available to the Blue Cross participants. And I don't mean to dismiss or make light of this. It's almost like it's a buffet and each patient's care is tailored so that I may be needing physical therapy twice a week for the full 16 weeks where someone else may be able to do it once a week for half the program and then they're done. They may be succeeding more under massage and acupuncture, whereas that hasn't worked for me at all. So it's a very customized program within the, the program design. We have a bundled rate with the University of Vermont Medical Center. The, the success that they have seen thus far is very promising, and it's, it's just something we're so excited to have up and running right now. We are looking to expand it. Um, North, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital has expressed interest in it, as has Springfield, and so we're in uh, conversations right now with both of those facilities. And I think, Sarah, that's it for me. Um, Gracie, yeah, Gracie, are you tackling this one or am I? You can go for it if you're ready for it. I am. Okay. So moving through what we currently have in place for value-based programs, but we are also looking at new and, and innovative um, program expansion. I'm going to start with, um, we're very excited about our advanced primary care model that um, we're in the process of launching this year. Developed in partnership with providers and using the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's quadruple aim as our guide, the model is a very simplified, very integrated approach to healthcare that improves value and outcomes while maintaining, and this is really important, maintaining an exemplary experience, not just for patients, but for providers as well. That is part of the quadruple aim is that the providers are part of the entire vision for improved healthcare and um, satisfa work satisfaction, right? Workplace satisfaction. There are three um, sort of components to this um, advanced primary care model, disease management, uh, transformation of care, which is um, tools to help providers transition from the fee-for-service um, model of providing care to a model where they can work in a capitated environment. And then the third component, so important in primary care, is to um, reduce, if not eliminate, gaps in care. So um, that would mean, um, you know, high 
uh, panel management, um, identifying patients who have not had uh, annual physicals, you know, in X, over an X amount of uh, time, getting those people in, making sure that we're managing diabetics, patients with hypertension and asthma, all of the, the chronic diseases that we see here in Vermont. We look forward to providing you with, with more information. Um, the, uh, the launch will take place this year. If, um, we will take 12 months working with um, the participating providers. And at the end of that 12 month period, we will audit the program, looking at the, the metrics that are in place, both for quality and cost of care. And surveying the providers to understand what worked for them, you know, during this pilot period within this model and where are their opportunities for improvement. The second one is, again, um, something that is near and dear to, to my heart. And I, I like to say that we're, we're the proud sponsors and active participants in the Trauma-Informed Care Initiative that is being led by the Health Center in Plainfield and Dr. John Matthews. Under Dr. Matthews' leadership, the Health Center is actively working to become the first trauma-informed, trauma-trained, federally qualified health center and primary care practice in Vermont. This is going to be accomplished by training all of the staff to understand adverse child um, events and to understand the link between the trauma that took place in childhood and um, health issues that arise later, whether it's in late childhood, adolescence, you know, young adults, or, or even frankly in, in adults of, of any age, and to be able to work in advance of those health issues um, becoming apparent. Um, again, it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, it's, we believe that, um, under, again, with Dr. John Matthews and with the help of other individuals in the state, including um, Tom Reese, that um, once this program has been tested with the health center, that the goal is to then move it to all of the federally qualified health centers in Vermont. And then a pilot that is still in the research and development phase is our Centers of Excellence work through the Blue Cross Association's Blue Distinction and Blue Distinction Plus program for hospitals. Um, I, I really can't say much more other than to say that, you know, we're looking um, at um, orthopedics and, and perhaps imaging um, down the line. And we are definitely looking forward to providing the Green Mountain Care Board with further information as the pilot evolves. So just as a, with our work with One Care, you know, we have learned invaluable lessons as we develop and implement value-based pilots and programs. And Lou, I think you thought you were done, but I believe that you're going to walk us through the lessons learned, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, lucky me. <laughs> so, are, I'm going to check in. Sarah, was that you or was that me? I'm sorry. It sounds like we don't know the left hand and the right. Okay, I will take it. So, we definitely have, over the course of the past five or six years that I've been with Blue Cross, we have dipped our toe into value-based pilots and we've started some, we've ended some, and we've continued some, and we do feel like we've established a body of, uh, of work around what worked and what hasn't. One of the first things that's critical, no matter what program you want to join in with partnership with a provider, there have to be champions, both in the provider community and within Blue Cross, to, to basically be the ones that are going to help move the respective institutions forward to make sure that this program can get implemented and stood up and working. Um, it's, you can't jump into any sort of value-based programming half. It, you you got to jump in with both feet to be fully engaged and committed. And that includes being able to rally the support within your respective organizations. Um, flexibility and adaptability is something that we've learned recently. Um, 
we have, we're in a current pilot program with Evergreen Family Practice, and we started it a year ago. And it was very heavily informed by their experiences that we were having to sort of pivot and redesign and simplify our pilot sort of mid-course. But that actually engaged all of us much more um, strongly because we realized what their what their perception of the program was and where they thought it could go really was valuable feedback and it didn't make sense to wait to make those changes. So mid-course corrections sometimes may throw a monkey wrench in some of your evaluations, but the flexibility to be able to adapt should remain. Whether whether it's utilized or not, you know, that's going to be determined on a pilot by pilot basis. From a measurement and evaluation standpoint, you really, uh, you, you, there's some conflicting endpoints here. On the one hand, you want to have this really robust set of measures and you want to drill down and you want to be able to just get measured to the nth degree or success or failure, but that can become overly complex and unwieldy. So we're really trying to find where's that sweet spot for the measures that make sense, the measures that have value to the provider, to the member, and to Blue Cross, and are they simple enough to implement, measure, track, trend, you know, and, and take action on? And that's really sort of the second bullet. It, you, you can't measure for measure's sake, and you can't just do it because it sounds good or it's nationally done, but if it's a measure that sort of has a hollow resonance, that there's no real underpinning, you got to you gotta think twice about whether that makes sense to adopt. And then the payment structure, the payment structure is really where the rub comes in sometimes with the providers, because we're asking them to do more things or new things, and you need to make sure that you're compensating them fairly for what you are asking them to do and what they're agreeing to do. You know, whether it's a fee-for-service plus a cap component, whether you're trying to do a bundled rate or where you're trying to do um, fixed perspective payment, the priorities of the providers and Blue Cross have to be met. It cannot be a one-sided conversation. And I think um, the collaboration really lends to that conversation. I would say that in, in past years, all payers could acknowledge that a lot of our – payment reform efforts were sort of a top-down conversation, and a lesson learned is that that doesn't work. And then the incentive payments are really critical to any successful value-based program, but they have to be meaningful. And I don't mean they just have to be big enough to, to catch the attention of a provider and incentivize them to change, although I won't minimize that enough money makes sense and helps to engage the provider community, but it has to be the right sort of incentive. It has to be linked to an action or a service that everyone agrees, like the money makes sense to link it to this thing and that those two together will make your, your program successful. What we have to avoid is a reimbursement stream that just sort of loses its power and it's linkage to your activities. It can't just sort of become part of an expected revenue stream without like a call to action tied to it. Um, so this is, this is what we've gained over our years of experience. And um, I think that that's done for the lessons learned. And I think we're going back to Grace or Sarah. And I just need to advance the slide one more time. <laughs> there we go. So um, you did ask, the Green Mountain Care Board asked us to speak about cost containment. And I will tell you that I cannot do each of these programs justice. I think um, each of them could be an entire presentation unto itself. So I'm just going to give you the high level, and, I'm, and we can certainly follow up with additional um, information later and also um, when Dr. Flavin is able to participate. He can certainly provide a lot more information on these. So the first is our Vermont Blue RX pharmacy program. And because pharmacy, as I mentioned before, is one of the largest cost drivers in healthcare, this is certainly an area that we focus on for cost containment. 
Um, and then we do a number of things and have a, a variety of programs that all fall under this umbrella of the Vermont Blue X program. So I'll just list a few of them and then talk a little more detail about one of our programs. So um, we obviously negotiate lower prices through our PBM and rebates. We also have step therapy programs um, and also a program that we only pay for specialty drugs that actually help the patient. So if the member has to abandon the course of therapy um, in the middle, um, we are not required to pay for those drugs. So it's a way to make sure that that we're doing the right thing for our members and not charging them for things that aren't working. Um, but the, the one part of the program that I wanted to speak to the most is um, we now have two additional pharmacists who work directly with members and providers for patients with complex um, and chronic conditions who are taking a number of different um, drugs that could conflict or um, may have side effects. So usually the pharmacist will do a full medical review with the patient, um, all of their records from all of their providers, um, and look through each drug one by one. Um, they try and understand how the patient is tolerating the medication, how long they've been taking it, if they have side effects um, that, that may be making it difficult to take a particular drug or if it's interacting with other drugs in a way that, that harms the patient or even just doesn't make them feel very good. Um, and then they're also, of course, looking at cost. So if there are lower cost alternatives, they work with the member to see if that um, would be helpful for them um, and also where to obtain them at the lowest price. And then they will also work um, with the patient and the provider to get the um, prescriptions changed if that's necessary that, so they can take advantage of the, of the, um, the drug. So that's um, I believe a really interesting program. I think our pharmacist came and spoke to one of the Green Mountain, the Green Mountain Care Board's um, committees for primary care. Um, and it's an, it's an interesting and innovative one, and it really reaches out to the member um, and the provider together to try and collaborate to make, make the, the drug regimen work. Um, so there there is more in pharmacy, but I will switch now to the um, lab benefit manager. Um, I believe it was a year and a half ago that we um, we um, began an agreement with Avalon and we before that didn't have a network for laboratory and we were seeing it wasn't in Vermont so much but um, out-of-state labs were often um, people's uh, work is sent that um, the prices were not um, they were they were very high um, and so working with Avalon we were able to create a lab network and pull down costs and 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 also create better relationships I, we believe between the provider and the laboratory that they're using um, the next one um, I know we've spoken a little bit to the Green Mountain Care Board about Civica RX we really believe that this is a a completely innovative way to approach drug prices by um, manufacturing and distributing them um, in the lowest cost method. We believe that this should um, help take up the, the distribution of drugs and the pricing of drugs. Um, so this started out, just to give you a teeny bit of background if you, if, if you um, don't remember it, um, it began with a coalition of hospital systems to um, to manufacture generic drugs that they were having a difficult time um, obtaining, and and they so those are on the medical side. Then they created a new subsidiary that on, with partnership from health plans. And so the blue system is a big part of this, but there are a lot of other partners, um, other insurers as well as the state of California. Um, and what we are looking at on this side is to manufacture generic. Um, at retail. Um, they are just beginning to be introduced in the market. I think some of the first ones will hopefully be this summer. So we haven't seen, you know, this is a lot of, we have to make the investment up front and take some time to see the results. Um, and then the second piece on this that we announced this winter was the investment in a facility that's going to manufacture insulin. Um, and the really interesting part about the insulin piece is that this will have a um, MSRP, essentially a sticker with the price on the drug. Um, I think for some of the insulins, the average price is about $180, and this is expected to be $35. So we really want to pass the savings on directly to consumers 
um, and insulin is a space that everyone is worried about. So again, uh, we could speak a lot more in detail about the, about any of these, but but that's just a high level of what some of these programs are. Um, this is the value-based FIT testing program, so the one that's not to be confused with the one we spoke about earlier. This is FIT testing for colorectal screening. Um, this really got off the ground during COVID. This was one of the, I guess, positive benefits of COVID when people couldn't go in for their um, colonoscopy. Um, uh, providers were were um, looking at ways to help ensure the, you know, that patients still were coming in for testing. Um, and so this was a program we worked on. Um, it's it's still just getting going, but we believe that it really has benefits. Um, and it, it did get a kickstart during COVID, which was nice. Um, and the last one, the Provider Passport Program, you may be thinking it's odd that I stuck it here under cost containment. Um, but traditionally, PA programs are among other things, cost containment efforts, there's certainly efforts to ensure that the appropriate care is getting to the patient at the right time and avoids duplication. But the unique thing about our provider passport program is now we're trying to achieve efficiencies on the provider side as well by um, identifying, and this is a, you know what's known nationally as a gold carding program, but identifying providers that have very high levels of approval and simplifying the process for them and then reviewing the results to make sure that um, we're still seeing the same um, level of outcomes that we've always wanted to look for. So um, we've got it here. It's, it's still moving along. It certainly um, didn't have the volume of um, information that we need for a thorough process because of the, you know, the, the slowdown during COVID, but we believe at the end of this year, we'll have more data to provide real information about the success of this particular program. So that was quick, I realized, and very high level. Um, hey, but we Sarah, wanted to just put those out there. Yeah. Sarah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I just um, add a little on around Avalon? Yeah. So uh, Blue Cross was Avalon's fourth client. Uh, we've been under contract with them since 2019. And while we did have our own lab network, um, one of the things that's hard for us as a payer to do is to really scrutinize the value of each lab that approaches us to participate and to, to determine the clinical validity of their actual tests, because there are a lot of labs that provide tests that aren't, you know, that they haven't met the rigor of being a meaningful and valid test. And so one of the big values that Avalon brings to the table is that because they create the lab network and that's their area of expertise, they're able to filter out sort of the fly-by-night labs and the ones that aren't FDA approved um, and present a, a fully robust uh, lab network that can meet all of the provider's clinical needs, um, but it's a much narrower network. So it, it offers competitive pricing, and we have seen substantial savings through our relationship with Avalon. So I just wanted to expand a little bit about that to say that we do have two years of experience under our belt with them, and it's proven to be a really beneficial relationship for us and for our members. So thanks. Thank you, Lou. Um, and so I think I wanted to sum this slide up by saying that savings we achieve through any of our cost containment um, efforts are always passed through to our members in rates. So um, that's why we do these in addition to a number of other reasons, but we really do want um, our members to see the benefit. So our, that is the end, and I'm going to pull the slide deck down so we can see you <laughs> um, and hopefully answer questions if you have them. Sure, I'm sure that uh, we have lots of them. Um, I'll start off with one, Sarah. Um, where is the man manufacturing occurring for the Civic RX generics? Um, there's one facility, I believe, in North Carolina. Um, they're both in the United States, if that's what you're asking. And there's another that might be in New Jersey, but let me let me verify that one. Um, the, okay. the insulin is being manufactured in a different facility than the other drugs because there's different um, requirements for that. Just curious because uh, okay. I've been following the uh, beginning stages of a project in uh, Virginia where um, the federal government has pumped in a lot of money along with uh, 
private money um, working with the Virginia Commonwealth University to create a uh, manufacturing facility to uh, um, make generics to uh, try to, uh, um, apparently there is a supply shortage and, and I'm not too familiar with that, but um, so I thought that was an interesting concept and I was just curious where uh, the manufacturing facilities were gonna be for Civica. So I look forward to it. For sure. I think the other benefit is um, we having the manufacturing facilities in the United States um, will help with the supply chain issues that other that we've been seeing for other drugs um, during the COVID shutdown. The other thing I'm curious if um, anyone at Blue Cross took a look at the proposal to um, try to create um, a Vermont wholesaler for prescription drugs. And if there's any merit to that whatsoever, or if it just doesn't make any sense. You know, so I'm not the expert. It, it would be our um, pharmacy benefit team. And I think our only concerns there are um, scale and volume as a state, even if we get every one of our, you know, members involved across all three payers, major payers, I mean, commercial, Medicaid and Medicare, um, that's still not that much volume. Um, in the big picture. So so that's our, our big concern with that. But we're not saying it couldn't work. We're just not sure if there's enough volume in our state. We're still kind of small. Okay. So uh, board members, I'll open it up to uh, questions or comments on the presentation that you heard. Um, we'll go in alphabetical order, starting with uh, Dr. Holmes, Jessica. Hi, well, thank you. Um, thank you all of you for uh, lots of Updates on interesting initiatives. I appreciate it. Maybe can we actually, can you pull the slide up eight? Just quickly, it might be the easiest. I have a couple of questions about that. I think we lost Sarah's audio though, somehow. <laughs> if it's not possible, that's fine. I, I will ask based on my quick notes down here. Um, my first, all right, maybe you are able to pull it up. Must be Sarah's using Rebecca's computer. Yeah, I think it's number eight. eight. It was about impediments to success or obstacles to success or something like that. This one? There we go, impediments to success. Um, so I actually wanted to ask you about a couple of these bullet points a little bit further. The one about lack of actionable reporting and analysis for providers and Blue Cross. Um, and this is related to the data that I assume that you're getting from One Care Vermont, right? That was what this was in reference to. So I wanted to, and you said, um, you made reference to the data not being detailed enough. And I wanted to ask you if you could provide a little bit more elaboration on that. One of the things that I have heard from uh, hospital leaders is that the data that they get is a lot. It's very detailed and often it's not actionable in some sense because it's so overwhelming and there's so much detail in there. So I'm curious as to um, your perspective on, on the level of detail and what data you would rather see it will be helpful and actionable. Right, great. Um, so I understand and I know that the, the discussion of data has been going. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's what I wanted to make sure. Um, and I'll have a, a great jump in too, but you know, there's been a, a long discussion about data and as a payer, we provide a lot of plain data. So that's what I believe we have in probably excessive detail um, that needs um simplifying in order to be useful. Um, but what we get back and what we hear that the um, that the providers get it on some level is too old sometimes. You know, you need to you need to be pretty quick with the data in order to actually help a member or or you know um, get in in time. And then um, sometimes it's not detailed enough for the data and there's like panel data provided on on the entire um, practice and not individual data. So, so that's some of the, I think, the issues that we're talking about. Um, Grace, do you want to jump in on this one? Sure. So I'll put my provider hat on for a moment, having um, worked in the FQHC world for 10 years. 
Um, when, when Blueprint was actively reporting to practices, we received essentially practice-specific reports that benchmarked providers within our practice so that they were able to understand their success um, against their peers. And we were also benchmarked against other practices. What happened, and I don't, I don't understand fully where the breakdown took place, but the practice-specific reports that did have actionable information in them, and I know at, at Batten Gill Valley Health Center, we use those reports as part of our quality improvement program. Somewhere along the way, um, something broke, and instead of the reports being practice-specific, they became HSA. Specific, which was just not helpful at all. I understand anecdotally because, again, I'm no longer on the provider side of the, the healthcare um, system. I, I understand that that is still the case. In terms of the data we receive um, from One Care, I think the the report um, was carefully designed. Um, we we don't we don't find a lot of value in it, and our goal um, for 2023 is to work with One Care to redesign the report in a way where um, we actually we actually get something meaningful out of the report. Great. Well, one of the, I mean, I don't know if you, if there's, if there's time and, and uh, ability, but if anybody, somebody could follow up and give us a little bit more detail about what you're missing and what you would like to see in those reports, I think it would be helpful. So as we do have conversations with one care as well and around the effectiveness of the data, I think that would be helpful. So I would appreciate that if there is a follow-up that could happen. That, that is not a, um, a condemnation of one care. You know, this is, Reform is just evolving, and along with it is how we manage and look at data. And so we just see it as, as essentially a, a quality improvement um, project. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Obviously, everything is evolving and learning and you're pivoting, and so it would be helpful to see how it's iterating and what would be most helpful. Um, the second one then was, and I know you pulled down the slide, but lack of clarity um, around care coordination. So I would love to hear the solution, if any solutions around there, about what you would like to see to avoid costly duplication of care coordination or, you know, to improve uh, effectiveness for patients who need, you know, a high risk patients who do need that care coordination. What is a solution that you see to gain that clarity and or to optimize um, the use of those care coordination resources? I'm going to speak to this one. So there seems to be some confusion um, at One Care as to whether or not care coordination services are provided. Um, I know because I work with the folks that are sort of at the front lines at One Care that they provide a decentralized care coordination program. They have a, a very um, extensive and well-designed um, policy and procedure around this program, um, but they don't provide those services directly, whereas we do. And the blueprint um, um, care teams do as well. So in our agreement, we actually spell out that we will work together to avoid duplication of services, and we meet regularly with one care. But I think I think I think it'd be very helpful because Blueprint is providing these services, OneCare is providing, albeit decentralized, we're providing it as our other payers, and providers are also providing care coordination services. And it would make sense to bring these four groups to the table and to begin to coordinate these services, care, coordinate care coordination, um, to avoid duplication of effort and to take advantage of our resources in a, in a more effective and efficient way. Has there been any uh, attempt to put that working group together, make a working group? 
not to date, but we are happy to work with with um, the blueprint and with One Care and provide a representative to do so. Okay, great. Um, another question then I have uh, was about the fixed perspective payment pilot um, that you all have initiated with CVMC and some practices. Um, and, it, and it strikes me, I just as I think about it, it's still reconciled to fee-for-service, right? So at the end of the day, it's really built on a fee-for-service chassis. It's, it's not really fixed perspective payment. In some sense, it's a bit of a misnomer in the sense that fixed perspective payment, the intent of it was to shift more risk to the providers. But if it's at the end of the year reconciled to fee-for-service, it's really just a cash flow mechanism, but it's still fee-for-service underlying that. So it, part of what I was <clears throat> thinking as you were describing, you know, there, that you're not seeing or it's not clear to you what the benefits to members are of it, not surprising if it's really just cloaked fee-for-service. Um, so I'm wondering if you have a plan to move that program towards unreconciled uh, fixed perspective payment, like, you know, true fixed perspective payment and what obstacles you would see um, from from providers or operational obstacles on your front from doing that, making it truly unreconciled. Sure, and I, I think I was trying to, um, to to show that that that's actually one pair is the one that negotiates the contract for the fixed prospective payment and makes the monthly payments. Um, so so we're willing to work with them and we want to work with them to move on. We recognize everything that you've said that, that once you're reconciling to fee for service, it's not really a FPP. And to be honest, the reconciliation process is pretty cumbersome. And so now it's, um, you know, more work than it would be if we just paid based on claims or did FPP alone. Um, I think I mentioned it and, and we should involve the, the providers in the discussion of how much risk they're willing to take on. Um, and that, again, is something that is negotiated through OneCare. Um, they're the entity that is taking on the risk, I believe, for some of the providers, um, especially the primary care providers that are participating now. So there's probably different um, obstacles for the hospitals versus the PCPs, um, and we need to look at them differently um, and address them that way. Um, that's not a full answer, but kind of a partial answer. <laughs> Okay, maybe we should just stop calling that fixed perspective payment. I mean, maybe we need another term for it, to be honest with you, because if it's reconciled, it's fee for service with an asterisk. <laughs> That's maybe what I would call it. Um, and I guess my last question is, uh, I know that Blue Cross Blue Shield has a lot of data that you do have on quality and on prices. Um, of, of services, the price variation across facilities. And I guess I'm wondering how might Blue Cross Blue Shield share that data directly with providers, primarily primary care providers that are actually directing services, managing care and making referrals across the state. Um, how might Blue Cross Blue Shield share some, share some of that quality and price differential data directly with the providers? Grace, do you want to answer the data question? <laughs> yes. Um, but let me just go back one minute to your question, Member Holmes, about um, FFP, if I may, um, because we did anticipate this question and we, we talked with our actuarial department and they asked us to share with you that um, in order to, to move fee for, uh, fixed prospective payments forward, any capitation models forward, um, first we have to achieve post-pandemic stability for providers. I mean, that's just a given, right? Um, we have to work to resume risk in our agreements because, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, right now we have a, a capped risk arrangement with OneCare um, because of, of COVID. And then we do have to work together to develop a, a methodology for unreconciled um, fixed perspective payments. And that's something that um, OneCare and, and Blue Cross are, have, have actively started that conversation. Um, and, you know, our hope is to continue it through 22 and 23 um, and arrive at a, a model that, 
that we can all um, we can pilot and understand if it works. Um, and then back to the, the reporting, provider reporting. So through our advanced primary care um, model pilot, we have de developed, we're developing two reports um, for um, providers. One will be on the agreed upon metrics. So for example, um, we're going to be focusing on um, type 2 diabetics and um, patients with uncontrolled hypertension during the first 12 months. So we will be reporting back to them and actually meeting with them. Dr. Plavin will be meeting with the providers um, on a quarterly basis. But then we have this much larger list of, of metrics that include um, uh, patient satisfaction, as well as um, financial outcomes. And that's something that we're going to be tracking internally and also sharing with providers. So um, we'll, we'll be back to you with more information. And um, you know, once these reports have been templated and, and tested you know, in meetings with, with the participating providers in the pilot. Great, but actually, what I mean, and I think that's really helpful. I guess let me just clarify my question. Um, I'm also thinking about when providers make referrals, and maybe this is, is still in, as part of your answers. When when primary care providers make referrals, you know, for surgeries, for colonoscopies, for MRIs, for for things that are outside of their practice, there is information that that Blue Cross Blue Shield has, for example, on price variation of some of those services, and maybe even quality outcomes of some of the surgical procedures and things like that, if primary care providers were with were armed with more of that information about price and quality variation, you know, it might help inform, be a data informed decision about where the referrals might go. So I'm, I'm wondering more about that. So this is Lou. Grace, can I take a first stab? I just want to remind everyone that we do have our cost tool on our website that we and all the payers are required to have. So that tool is out there and available for both the, the members and the providers to use. Now, let's be honest, the uptake on using those is not super high, um, but that is an existing tool that provides some really good information. Um, I actually, um, <laughs> this has been ironic, I'm, I'm an FEP member, so I don't have access to the Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont website. I have the FEP website. I had a demo of the cost tool that's available, and I was so surprised at how much information you can glean as an end user. Um, and we do, we are looking pretty closely at Developing some documentation and some programming around exactly what you're discussing, Dr. Holmes, is, you know, are there, are there certain high volume services that might be considered more a commodity service where a personal relationship with the provider is, is you know, I, I don't have a personal relationship with whoever x-rays my ankle, for example. Um, can we make some information available so that if they have patients who need MRIs or CAT scans or colonoscopy, that they are there, they have the tools to present this information to their patients, but also it's information that we want to have internally so that we can offer that information to our members as well, so that, that there would be two avenues of distribution. Um, and it's, it sounds super easy, <laughs> and, and in some instances it is, but then it's how do you how do you how do you package it? How do you get it in front of them? Because the clinicians are so busy in their offices, to give them a tool that they can readily have ready access to that doesn't sort of disrupt their flow, and that oh, this is the tool for Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont members. I might have a different tool for a different payer that tells me where they might want their patients going. That's that's where we bump into the potential for provider abrasion. And administrative burden. Got it. Well, thank you. I appreciate the answer. And all my all your answers. I'm I'm done, Chair Mullen. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Next, we'll move to Board Member Lunch. Robin. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on some of Jess's questions around the actionable data, um, particularly with the ACO relationship. So the one of the legislature's consultants, Donna Kinzer, when she was working with HROC, had talked about some ways that other states handle uh, the data kind of relationship with ACOs, where the payers provide more 
uh, instead of providing raw data, package the data themselves, which then goes uh, through the ACO. So I was just curious what you thought about that idea um, or any other uh, kind of ideas about how to make that work better on um, sort of a statewide basis to the point uh, that Lou just made, of course, um, if the provider is getting one thing from Blue Cross, something else from MVP, something else from Medicaid, and something else from Medicare, the light in all likelihood they're you know their heads are going to explode and they're going not going to use any of them. So how do we try to figure out how to move forward with something that's more actionable from a provider perspective and multi-payer? I'm willing to take um, a stab at that. Um, I, I think we we have the mechanism in place through the through the blueprint, and if we can um, reinvigorate the blueprint program, I, I think and get back to the reporting that providers received in the past, um, and and with our help, with, with the payers' help as well, because let's face it, the, the best data is is combined claims and and right and and EHR data. Um, but I feel like you know what, one of the things we do in healthcare is we are constantly recreating the wheel instead of looking to see what's been done, what's been tried and tested. And in in my opinion, again provider hat on, I, I think the blueprint um, program has been one of the most successful reform initiatives that our state has embraced. And, and I look forward to its future. Thank you. Um, related to that, I was curious how, um, and if you've been working with the blueprint on your medical home or your advanced practice primary care program. That doesn't mean that we will not in the future. Okay. Because to your point, I think trying to figure out again how to utilize a statewide yep. approach would be great. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, hold on just a second. I'm checking my notes here for some of my other questions. So I was very interested to hear about some of the value-based programs that you have been working on. Um, and I was wondering if you could just speak a little more generally about how you approach expanding those programs when you have determined that they are successful and um, whether you've thought about how to share your successes with um, DIVA or other payers in order to, again, move forward on more of a multi-payer approach, if you had ideas there. Yeah, so um, around something like the pain program that is with the University of Vermont Medical Center. So we definitely, uh, I talked a little bit about how we've got two other hospitals that are very interested in, in creating a similar program, you know, not adopting it whole cloth, but designing it in a way that meets their care team and their community needs. Um, and we've also been talking to Diva about seeing if Medicaid would be interested. It, you know, it has a pretty large population of patients that would be eligible for the, the chronic pain program. So those conversations have definitely been taking place. Um, I certainly can't I can't speak to the other commercial payers because really this was something that we developed in conjunction with UVM. I think they approached us around it. So probably some of the expansion to the other payers would be at the at the provider side and not on our angle. Yeah. Um, for something like the in-home program through HCRS and Howard Center, we absolutely are looking to expand those programs. And I don't mean to sound dismissive, but you know, we we value our innovation and believe that it gives us a competitive edge. So it's probably less likely that you would see my contracting team or me reaching out to the other payers to say, hey, do you want to join in with us? Um, sure. I don't I don't mean to come across inappropriately, but you know, what we do we think is ours and is great. 
I would encourage the providers who have these programs with us to then approach their other payers to say, hey, we have this with this program and then with this payer, would you be interested in doing something similar? And, and that does happen. It definitely happens, um, certainly in conversations that I have with hospitals in the state where they will identify a reimbursement stream or a program that they have in place with some of their other payers and could we model something similar. Thank you. That, that you know, we recognize that we our, our, our pilots, our value-based um, pilots and programs have, have grown now to, to the size that we need to formalize how we not only identify new ideas um, and, and implement, but how to evaluate whether or not um, a pilot is successful and should be moved to program status or whether the pilot should be sunsetted because we did not find any value in it. And so one of the things that we're working on right now is a, essentially an innovation lab. And as part of that, um, we will be, as I mentioned earlier, annually we will be auditing all of our programs, all of our pilots, all of our programs um, internally to understand if, if they are meeting the goals that we set out for them, both for quality and for um, total cost of care. And in addition, we'll be surveying um, our um, participating um, providers um, and their staff to understand, again, where can we improve if we've, de if we've deemed that a pilot is worth continuing to, um, to work with. Um, so, I, I give you more information, but the idea has just just begun to change shape, um, and we're just at the moment referring to it as our reform innovation lab. Great. Um, I think that's all of my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll move to board member Pelham. Tom. Good morning. Um, yes, it's still morning, and thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, I just have a couple of questions. My first is that um, a question about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Um, the all pair model has been uh, in play for almost five years now. We're in our last year of it, and maybe uh, you know it looks like we're going to get an extension of some sort. Um, and there are a lot of moving parts, you know, as we can see from your presentation. Uh, that are related to um, value-based uh, payments and, and, and health care reform. But I think, you know, I, I think that one that is foundational and critical um, is f fixed perspective payments. I mean, from, from true fixed per per perspective payments, you get the incentive for people to innovate and be creative and to use the resources available to them as wisely as possible. And so I'm just kind of looking in the rearview mirror a little bit here and looking at last year's hospital budget process. And the hospitals told us uh, in their uh, responses to our guidelines that um, overall, uh, the level of fixed prospective payments was 15.7% uh, of all payments. Now, that's not true fixed prospective payments. That's a loosely defined fixed pr prospective payment. Uh, and that Medicare, where there is reconciliation, was at 33.8% of their payments. Medicaid uh, was closer to true fiscal perspective payment and at 43% of payments. And hospitals, I mean, commercial was at three tenths of 1%. So the hospitals are telling us that um, they expected for fiscal year 22 only uh, less, less than a percent of fixed perspective payments. And that amount is 4.7 million out of 1.6 billion in commercial payments. And I think the 4.7 million is tied to the project at the Southern Vermont uh, um, Hospital, if, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, this was kind of confirmed in the rate review process where the index rate was developed and, and capitation, the amount of capitation in, in the index rate for both MVP and for Blue Cross Blue Shield was less than 2%. So I think that's the arena of where we are right now. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering, and the ACO also developed kind of targets for different payers. And for commercial, they were looking for their target 
in, in, in their budget approval was for 2022, 2.9%, from for 2023, 23.9%, and for 20 fiscal year 2024, 44.9%. Now, I'm, I'm not taking those to the bank, but I'm just wondering, what do you folks think? Um, I mean, we're a long way down the road in terms of reform. I think to the general public, you know, they would say that, you know, five years, seven years, you know, you know, when are we, when is this going to, going to be in place? So my question is, what do you think the proper target is uh, in Blue Cross Blue Shields payments that comprise true fixed perspective payments? So we, we have the, the ACO, they're saying for 2023, let's, let's have, and set a target for 23.9%. Uh, We're not going to hit that. It's just not going to happen. But so in year six and seven and eight, wh where is the end game in terms of fixed perspective payments where it's a, at enough of a critical mass that it's making a difference uh, 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 in the system, which we all anticipate? That is a good question. So you're asking what portion of our total payments should be FPP in order to actually start to drive some change. Um, and I don't think I know the answer to that, certainly more than we have now. Um, and you know that. Uh, um, probably more than 50% is where we will eventually need to be. Um, but but working towards that number is 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 tough. I think the other thing that's happened is because Medicaid went in first, um, the providers have had to take on the risk for those programs, and it may make them more hesitant to take on the commercial risk where, you know, there's more money and, and, and a little bit more at risk. And then I do think that there is a fundamental difference between Medicaid as a payer and commercial payers. We really are looking at ways to get savings back to our members if there are any. Um, and some of that is because, you know, because of the cost shift, we pay more than everyone else for the same services. We want our members to benefit if there are some um, efficiencies and savings that could be realized through these payments. And so we, we do need to have a mechanism to make that happen. So that's so a little bit, I don't think I gave you a number and um, it's a little bit of a roundabout answer, um, but that's what we're thinking about. But you, you might be smarter for you to set a number for us rather than we set a number for you. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I, I want to follow up on where you were going there on the cost shift. I, I do worry about that if we are successful in this effort, and it's a very complicated effort, it's 20% of the room economy, um, and what we're all trying to do is, uh, is, a, is a heavy lift. But if we do, um, uh, if we are successful and we are starting to see savings in the systems, you know, um, I worry that those uh, savings get siphoned off either through, I think what I believe, either through the cost shift, which I can see in the state budget process, I can see it, um, or um, my phone is ringing in the background. I apologize for that. I'm not going to answer it. Um, or uh, as Doug Hoffer kind of believes, it's an issue of, of kind of the monopolistic practices of the, of, of, of the UVM network. Um, either way, um, it, it's, the result is um, a siphoning of savings that is achieved out of the system. So do you, do you have any take on whether or not the, um, the, the structural problem here is a cost shift? Where by the where the public payers are just not paying their fair share, or that it is that the monopolistic practices of of the largest uh, you know fifty percent of of, uh, of of the health healthcare dollar in Vermont because it kind of makes a difference as to if you're trying to preserve these savings for your customers for as you say push it back down you know to 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 um, your uh, premium payers you know. What's the strategy? Is it to to focus on the UVM Medical Center network, or is it to focus on Diva to um, pay pay more of their fair share of the cost of of Medicaid? So 
of where, uh, you know, what are the other ch um, places that the savings could go? What we want is to see in our contracts and in our arrangements, either through one care or directly with the provider, a mechanism for our members to see the savings. So we want to, to have some, you know, specific guarantees that if there are savings, some of it comes back to our members. Um, and, and then it won't matter as much what the other sort of theories you have are about where, where savings could go, but we need to protect our members and their interests. So um, you were breaking up a little bit on that answer. Um, oh, sorry. So uh, if you could summarize it again quickly. We need to do in our in our agreements um, with one care and with the providers is ensure that the money can't the savings can't all get siphoned off in some other direction. It doesn't matter which one it is. We need to ensure that some of it comes back to our members. Um, okay. So so that's what we're our focus is. Um, and that's all I have. And I've uh, you know your responses to Jess and Robin have been. Uh, helpful as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, throw a couple quick questions at you on the uh, maybe we could ex expand the discussion on the passport program or the gold card. And could you tell us um, what percentage of previously required prior OS are now um, being um, eliminated by this program and what are the standards for um, allowing someone to um, receive the passport or the, the gold card as a provider? I said that it's only on advanced imaging so far. That's where we started. Um, and what we did, and I should have had the numbers in front of me, we looked at the percentage of a provider's PAs that were um, approved in the past three years. And we, can't, it's in the 90s, but say X provider, um, you know, 95% or more of their prior authorizations are always approved. So we looked at different levels and we have three tiers. Um, sort of the first tier, um, if they're in the, and maybe it's even as high as 97%. Um, 97%. Thank you, Lou. And yep. if you want to jump in, Lou, you, you might have no more of the details here than I do. But um, so those those providers, um, we're, we didn't eliminate all of the um, administration because we still need to see what they're doing um, in order to evaluate the program. So we require them to put some information in, but there's no approval process that automatically um, is approved. Um, the second tier, is it 90 to 97? 90, 95. 95 to 97. So that's the second tier. And it required a little bit more information from the provider, but still almost always authorized. And then the third tier is the normal process. So um, do you know, Lou, the percentages that we've seen? Um, it's a pretty, if you're asking the percentage of providers who have some level of waiver, it's a very small percent. Um, I would, I have to dig up the numbers to give you an exact, but it's not a huge swath of our network, unfortunately. Um, and it's something we do want to expand, but we are going to need to have some years of non-COVID, you know, utilization for it to allow us. I think you said we were reevaluating at the end of 2022. Um, and Chair Mullen, I think you asked sort of what measures were used. So there are clinical criteria for every advanced imaging study. And then if, a, if an authorization request comes in, it either meets or doesn't meet those criteria. So that the denial rates that we're looking at where they need to be 3% or less for the first tier, 5% or less for the second, um, we're really looking at how do, the, how do the ordering providers measure up against those objective national criteria. Um, so it's not, we're not creating some sort of evaluation process. We're relying on, on what's already out there through our advanced imaging partner, AIM. And I, I hope that answered your question. It does. Um, do you have plans to expand beyond imaging? And I'm curious if you've had any conversations with your um, pharmacy manager about uh, possibly doing anything on the pharmacy side. 
Um, I don't know if we're looking at beyond imaging. Once you leave imaging, um, then the work really falls to us so that we've got a much higher volume of throughput than for the advanced imaging. So I would need to see if we've got any plans in the work. Grace or, or Sarah, I don't know of any. I think the work is typically, look, yeah, and the work is typically more commonly looking at every year, looking at those services that hit the prior authorization requirement list to see what can be shed from that and what can be eliminated. And then if there are any new things that have to be added, which really doesn't get to the heart of trying to reduce the burden of the prior authorizations. But, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, the PA programs are in place because they do save money. Um, not every provider practices in the same way so that there's just not sort of this standard approach on how care is being provided and what services are being ordered. So our employers rely on the fact that we do have a robust PA program in place mm -hmm. with as light a touch as possible for the provider, but we have them in place because they save us money. And, you know, that there, there are services that are being ordered that don't, meet, don't rise to medical necessity. So, uh, you know, I don't know that we would ever strip them away entirely, but we definitely do annually look at it. Okay. On care coordination, you talked about it, and certainly care coordination is central to any successful effort. Um, do you have thoughts on how to better coordinate care coordination and if there should be a state group and how you would envision that uh, um, being comprised um, to try to really um, make it more central to a lot of the decisions? I believe it is as simple as bringing all of the providers of care coordination to the table to have a discussion to understand where there's duplication of effort and where we can minimize that duplication of effort and where we can partner. And if we're doing more care coordination for, you know, diabetic patients with and, and producing better outcomes, then perhaps we take the lead with that particular uh, patient population, but it is all about, and this is, this is where um, reform, this is the only way reform is going to succeed, is getting all of the right people to the table and having a conversation and working together to put a statewide plan in place. So we Grace, don't do you, enough. You mentioned, the, uh, you mentioned the incredible efforts of the Blueprint for Health and how foundational that is. And that's now under the office of the director of healthcare reform. Should there be um, a coordinated effort by that office to bring everybody together? Is it something Absolutely. that maybe we should be asking uh, Susan to reach out to uh, Ina Backus to try to get something going? Absolutely, and and we will do everything um, you know everything we can to help support um, Ina and and the blueprint. To make this happen. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember this, what I'm about to say often gets lost in the shuffle, that no matter how much we might want to have different entities perform care coordination, care management, all of us have our own regulatory or accreditation requirements that can't be put aside. So, and it's not just uh, Blue Cross under 903 and NCQA, but the hospitals might also have accreditation requirements around care coordination that they can't sort of let go of. There may be opportunities for some level of light delegation, but I think we just need to remember that we all have requirements that can't be entirely put aside as we look at how best to crack this nut. Um, and they shouldn't be the overarching drivers of any decisions we make, but they do need to be said out loud and remembered uh, as we try to find what is the best way to do this for our members, for Vermonters, and for the providers. Great. And just to, and Lou, just to push back on your answer on the uh, prior OS, um, has there been any type of analysis that um, any economic modeling that actually measures the costs that the providers 
are putting in place. You know, this has been an issue that's been talked about for the last 30 years. And, you know, you hear from providers how they have to have the uh, um, fancy headsets for their staff because they're always on hold on a call trying to get a prior auth and do this and that. I'm just curious, you, you're emphatic in your statement that it saves money but I'm just worried about whether or not all those costs that providers are building in is getting factored into that uh, cost saving analysis, or is it just the cost that you believe you're saving for the the um, employers that you're managing the insurance for? Yeah, you raise a good point. Certainly our analysis is not taking into account the provider abrasion. And so for any hospital systems or providers that are listening, their their hackles are probably going up right now. We do acknowledge that there are costs associated with that. I, the only work I know around it that, that has been shared with me, not at a granular level, has been with the University of Vermont Health Network, as we have worked with them to find creative ways to lessen burdens on the prior auth process, they have shared with me that they've got a pretty extensive team that has to manage the PA process for all of their contracts, you know, that span two states. So I think that they're a good example of, of probably tracking and trending what they're, what they need to put out to support the insurance process, not the Blue Cross process, not the MVP process, but all of us collectively. Um, I'm sure other hospitals probably have tracked and trended. It's not something that they've shared with me personally. Um, and we certainly are aware of the burdens that really rest with the smaller independent practitioners who might not have that same level of infrastructure. Um, so I think that's in the back of our mind. It doesn't come to the forefront in our own analysis at all, certainly, because that's just not information that we have to include into our return on investment. Um, but that is why we do need to look at our lists on a regular basis, what can be shed, what can be assumed. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how to get away from them entirely. You know, that, that, would, be, that would be another sort of statewide effort that would have to go into it. Um, I don't think there's a simple answer on that one, Chair Mullen. Thanks. I do think that the tiered approach, if you're uh, um, giving that uh, passport to uh, people that have uh, exhibited good practices, is an incentive for people to further exhibit good practices. And uh, it's a start, and hopefully we can build from there. So thank you for that effort. Um, I realize that uh, we've gone past the time that we had originally planned just for Blue Cross, but um, we do have to get the MVP as well. But before we do that, I will open it up for public comment on Blue Cross's presentation today. And it's been a fascinating discussion. And if we had more time, I think we could keep talking for the rest of the morning. But um, members of the public, does any member of the public wish to offer a public comment at this time? And I see that uh, Cynthia Browning has her hand up. Cynthia. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. My we can. Question, my question uh, concerns a flexible prospective payment plan. And as Teach Out was discussing, uh, perhaps we should call it a hybrid since it does have the reconciliation. And I may have missed it, but do you have any information about the nature of the reconciliation to the claims and fee for service at the end of the year? Do you end up making higher payments or lower payments? Are there changes in the quantity of tests offered? I didn't hear anything about that. And even though this is a hybrid, it seemed to me that the question of changes in cost or quantity of care would be important. And I acknowledge that it was during COVID. All right. So any, any comments on that, sir? Go ahead. Um, they're all great questions. Um, and I think the experience, the financial experience has been in both directions, to be honest, um, because it was done during COVID and, and then post COVID. Um, 
So I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. I can't give you those. And then we are working through one care to evaluate the, the quality for patients. Um, and so that might be something that we have to get back to you on, but, but they are great questions. I'm sorry, I don't have a full answer for you right now. Very understandable. Um, I understand the complexity and incompleteness of the data. I just wanted, I just wanted to raise that question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. Other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none, I wish to uh, thank the group from Blue Cross Blue Shield. And again, a fascinating discussion. And thank you uh, for spending your valuable time with us. We appreciate it. With that, I'm going to uh, transition over to MVP. And I'm not sure who from MVP is going to uh, coordinate, but uh, whoever it is, if you could... Uh, Introduce yourself and the, the rest of your team. Well, good morning, uh, Chair Mullen and members of the board. Um, first, I want to thank uh, thank all of you for the opportunity to discuss MVP's perspective and experience on this important topic. My name is Scott Momro. Uh, I'm the Vice President for Network Strategy and Strategic Relationship Management for MVP Healthcare. Um, my colleague, Matthew McKinnon, will also be presenting this morning. Um, Matthew is Vice President, Network Management and MVP, and collectively our teams um, work with our provider partners to manage, um, you know, strategy, relationships, execution of the innovative payment models. Um, we're also joined today by um, two of our medical directors, uh, Dr. Jason Rolla and Dr. Adam Coonan, who actually is based in Vermont, practice, still practices in Vermont, um, as well as our government affairs staff, uh, Jordan Esty is here representing that team. Um, so they'll be here to answer board questions and uh, manage any follow-up. So I'll go ahead and uh, share the deck if we're ready to go. Great, thank you. Can you see this the slide okay? We can. Okay, here we go. Um, so let's see. I'm going to try to advance it and see how well this works on our side. There we go. So we've prepared the following agenda today based on um, the information received from uh, Board Member Barrett inviting us today. Um, we were asked to speak uh, on types of payment reform projects that we've been working on, issues on cost containment, barriers of fixed perspective payments, and ways to move forward and accelerate. So we framed our agenda to first talk about our vision, talk about our experience um, and the current landscape and, and alternate payment models. Um, we're, we're pretty excited about the primary care capitation model that we launched in Eastern New York in 2021. So we'll highlight that and lessons learned. Um, talk about our roadmap um, and uh, discussions, um, current discussions with One Care Vermont related to um, payment reform. And then of course the cost containment initiatives and Matthew uh, McKinnon will be covering that topic. So I'll start with our mission. You know, our mission at MVP is to create and sustain healthy communities. And our goal is to grow business through innovations that put the needs of our members first. Um, so going left to right, you know, in partners, uh, we look for providers and health system uh, partners with aligned mindset and values. Um, we strive to provide members with a differentiated experience and care that works how, when, and where it's needed. Um, we believe uh, a, a key to the payment reform is provider-inspired collaboration in conjunction, you know, with our thoughts, ideas, and frameworks. Uh, we believe that's such a critical um, path for successful payment reform. Um, as it relates to our solutions in the middle, you know, we 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 understand they must meet both member and provider needs to be successful. That's the trick to really drive value. Um, you know, for example, offering competitive reimbursement while balancing affordability for members. Um, and we know we need to be flexible and innovative. Um, you know, when we work on these types of models with our partners, um, we consider readiness, you know, from the mindset, the commitment, as well as operational, um, and really think about that impact that we're trying to, to, to achieve and not to just get into an arrangement as the end goal, but really to tr drive that impact. Um, you know, there are other 
um, plants throughout the country that have a one size fits all model. Um, we realize as a regional not for profit plan that developing these models really requires that collaboration, that learning, the iteration, um, you know, for, for success. Um, and then finally, under Empower, we strive to provide integrated, proactive, and targeted information and tools to support decision making. I, you know, was listening intently to the conversation about data analytics information earlier, and and I think it's it's certainly an opportunity for all of us. In fact, MVP is currently pursuing um, a, a better analytics platform, and it's not just the platform. It's not just reporting static reports. It's how do you bring that clinical information, marry it with the claims data, provide insights for the providers as well as one care, as well as the payers, and, and make sure that information is getting where it needs to be, um, usually in the provider's workflow in a timely basis so it's actionable. Um, and I think that's a, a, a pretty significant challenge to move from that static reporting to that workflow-driven actionable information. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide. So this is, you know, a bit about the landscape and um, and, and New York and and Vermont. Um, you know, we've engaged in alternate payment models for 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 decade. You know, over a decade. Um, you could see the the laundry list here from pay per for performance um, to shared savings to risk to capitation innovation funding um, this is this is typically in the form of provider partners coming to us with innovative ideas programs new models of care where they're seeking funding um, so we, we typically pilot those with them um, and, and and try to invest to better understand with those experiments if it's something that we can all learn from um, as well as bundled payments um, you know we have programs of various provider organizations, including ACOs in both New York and Vermont across all lines of business. Um, I think you're well aware that we have a longstanding arrangement with the Adirondacks ACO that dates back to 2010. And, and, and um, as noted earlier, uh, you know, we entered into the agreement with One Care Vermont in 2020, uh, working on the commercial insurance programs. Um, you know, our focus is on promoting that accountability for coordination of patient care investment in primary care infrastructure um, with an expectation, you know, that there'll be an improvement in, in, in quality and efficient utilization of services as a result. Um, through these these programs, you know, I, I we, we share the sentiment uh, of, of some of the board members we've heard speak earlier that we're focused on moving away from fee-for-service volume model to population health management payment approaches that really help identify, target, stratify at-risk segments of the total population and help us achieve our, our cost objectives. Um, you know, we've, we've paid millions of dollars, sometimes uh, annually, um, as a result of improved outcomes, quality, cost, so on and so forth. Um, it is important to note, you know, COVID has come up in the prior conversation, and I, I do need to footnote that here, that it's important to note that um, some of our provider partners in New York um, and Vermont, to an extent, have paused their participation in alternate payment models in 2020 and 2021 or delayed their glide path towards progression, for example, from shared savings to shared risk or to, to, to capitation um, due to uncertainty as it relates to um, – trend, member utilization, complexities of target setting with the actuaries during the pandemic. Um, so our, our numbers as of today, approximately 26% of our total membership is under an alternate payment model. Um, and, and that corresponds to 20% of the total medical expen uh, expenditure. Um, you know, but we're, we're continuing to work to reinvigorate those conversations and move forward in, in new ways as, as we, you know, based on our learnings from the, the pandemic. So on this slide um, five, we have some, some examples, um, you know, starting at the top left, uh, pay for performance. Um, I, I know you're well aware of the Adirondacks ACO, all payer ACO model includes um, seven commercial 
payers, including MVP. Um, the, the ACO has paid a PMPM amount to coordinate patient care and invest in infrastructure. Uh, and through our arrangement, they have the ability to earn uh, additional um, dollars based on uh, quality performance. Um, shared savings. Um, to advance the member experience and, and quality and efficiency, um, you know, we do have uh, shared savings contracts under which providers um, can, can share in the savings if they hit the, the financial uh, target, medical expense target. Um, as an example, that's the, the type of arrangement we have with One Care Vermont currently, um, you know, starting in 2022 for, or tw excuse me, 2020 for small group and individual um, members. Um, as a result of this arrangement, actually, One Care Vermont received uh, $850,000 in shared savings in their first contract year based on performance. Um, I also wanted to note that MVP has engaged, especially in New York State, many of our FQHC providers and value-based uh, payment arrangements and through our participation in uh, the, the, the district goals that, set, that were set by uh, New York State for Medicaid. Um, in fact, we have approximately 40,000 members in shared savings or shared risk arrangements with FQHCs and in, in, in our network in New York um, and, and are very interested in thinking about how that expands and translates into Vermont. Um, shared risk. Um, MVP is 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 currently in um, in shared risk arrangements. For example, we have a Medicare Advantage uh, arrangement with the University of Rochester Medical Center, um, one of the nation's leading academic medical centers. Um, you know, they have provider network of over 2,000 um, community um, lives. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, providers located throughout the Rochester um, surrounding areas with six hospitals. Um, cancer center, oral, uh, oral health center, home care, assisted living, urgent care, extensive primary care network. And we have a significant um, shared risk arrangement in place where the providers share in savings um, if they hit their target or share in risk uh, should the expenses uh, be greater than their, their target. As it relates to capitation, you know, we've been involved in a variety of um, capitated, capitated arrangements over the years. Um, we have a long history in the Mid-Hudson region of New York State um, with capitation, especially uh, with, with Medicaid uh, line of business, um, primary care. We, we've also, we have capitated arrangements for dental care, lab services, skilled nursing, home, uh, home health. Um, we actually have recently entered into a joint venture uh, for global capitation uh, for dual eligible special needs plan members or DSNP members. Um, the new organization was created to provide specialized care and wrap services for those, those dual eligible beneficiaries for both Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide, but we recently launched an enhanced primary care model um, in, in Eastern New York and uh, the greater capital region. And I'll talk about that shortly. Um, a few other notes. We also, I meant, I, I talked about that innovation funding. Um, so in partnership with an IPA in New York, we Im implemented uh, MVMA. We implemented um, an innovation excellence program that was designed to re reward participating providers that have identified areas of improvement in their practice that will positively impact that member experience, have designed a unique or innovative program, and um, have implemented or in the process of Im implementing that program. Um, the programs have to have measurable goals uh, and they uh, need the uh, to have the ability to report on progress uh, throughout the year. Um, we have tiered funding levels and this 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 is available to all of the IPA participating providers um, with MVMA. And we've seen a lot of success, a lot of goodwill and a lot of excitement around that, that initiative. Um, we also, uh, have bundled uh, payment arrangements, um, for example, total joint replacement in complex cases of uh, end-stage uh, renal disease, chronic kidney disease. So moving on to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our new primary care model. Um, so in 2020, uh, when, when the pandemic really, really hit in the spring, we had many conversations with our provider partners. Um, about what's happening during the pandemic, about cash flow, about payment models. Um, and we really listened. We looked at the data and we moved ahead with this model in 2021. Um, you know, and, and I, I think it's not lost on this group that um, they were interested in, in predictable cash flow. 
um, to help with 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 optimal practice management. Um, but they also were interested in how can they focus on quality? How, how can they focus on team-based care with the new payment mechanism and really pave the way for other virtual care options or other experimental interventions uh, rather than focusing on that, that volume? Um, you know, goals of the model were to support that, that innovation and, and quite honestly discretion in the way um, the providers were offering services and intervention resources to meet the holistic needs of members. Um, we, we, we heard through our member data that it's really important, right, to promote member access um, to evolving forms of interaction. You know, we, we're, we're uh, telemedicine and, and, and beyond, and to really continue to drive that improvement. Um, the model's a, 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 a tiered capitation model with rates that are specific to um, patient cohorts and, uh, you know, age demographics, lines of business. Um, the practices are, are scored prior to the beginning mm -hmm. of the measurement year against performance metrics. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side, um, the measures all map to three core dimensions of either access, population, health, or member navigation. And you can see in the outermost ring um, examples of the types of um, metrics we're using to evaluate provider performance and, and, and help them improve in those areas that are um, really critical for our, our, our member experience. Um, so we swiftly uh, rolled it out. We have 25,000 members uh, engaged in that that greater capital region in eastern New York, um, representing 14 independent practices and five hospital systems um, that, that got involved um, in 2021. Um, so some notes on the rollout, some lessons learned. You know, provider engagement was interesting around this and working in partnership with the IPA was so critical to having all of these discussions. It started with education, um, reviewing the metrics, the philosophy, we offered substantiation for why each of these dimensions were selected and how it's meaningful and adds value. We provided each group details around their scoring. Um, you know, there were there were discussions where they, they had a lot of interest and curiosity around the, the data. Um, and, you know, if a practice was in, for example, a tier one and they're interested in moving to tier two, we gave them specifics and tried to be as um, point out insights and areas with that are actionable to help them move on that journey um, towards that higher um, that reimbursement model. Um, and we continue to discuss ongoing performance and support. Um, you know, for the implementation part of this, um, one of the key messages we heard as we were doing our listening tour was the model has to be simple and it has to be easy to implement. You know, they kept reminding us, we're busy seeing patients with COVID. We're trying to get our practices back on track. Um, we're, we're really trying to understand how we can do this without significantly placing a new administrative burden uh, on our practices. Um, so we, we, we kept that in mind and, and worked really tirelessly to enable providers to a smooth transition. Um, for instance, um, we, we required no changes at all in coding or billing to move to implement this model on, on their side. Um, you know, we have a monthly capitated payment that's calculated uh, using the attribution methodology um, against their provider roster. Um, and then we, we, we have uh, transparent reporting to the practices on a monthly basis um, so that their, their, either their clinical team or, you know, their financial teams can have direct access to that information um, and review it. Um, they receive their capitated uh, payments. Um, and, you know, attribution's tricky um, as you're rolling out new models. You need some flexibility. You need to be able to learn and work with them. Um, and, you know, we have conversations around making sure they're receiving the correct fee-for-service payments for any care provided to members that are not attributed to their practice in the CAP model and making sure that that continues. Um, and the other piece to this that I believe our colleagues at, 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 at um, Blue Cross mentioned is, you know, complete and accurate coding is still critical. We still need those claims for quality, for HEDIS type reporting, those types of things. Um, it's also used for attribution 
it, it's it's used for risk coding. It's used for identification for care management. So we still need that 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 reporting. I'm gonna move on to the next slide here. Let me click on this. There we go. So. You know, this slide is intended to share more about where we're at um, in, in our in our journey in Vermont and in our discussions with OneCare Vermont in particular. Um, you know, MVP and OneCare have had discussions since we um, engaged in earnest back in 2019, working towards that um, that that agreement year of 2020, the total cost of of care shared savings arrangement. Um, so. You know, we 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 have talked about the fixed prospective payments target um, back to those original conversations, and I actually think um, Chair Mullen, you can attest to that. We we you were a participant in, in those early conversations to help us get off, and, and thank you for that uh, underway with with One Care. Um, you know what we're what we're looking to do with One Care Vermont is. Um, move towards shared risk with a target of 2023. Um, both parties are are very interested in um, bringing that primary care capitation model um, to, in and ideally 2023. Um, there's some nuances with that. You know, MVP has a model that's very similar to the existing. Um, CPR model, the existing um, comprehensive payment reform model, um, you know, where it's a fixed payment differentiated by patient age and demographics, and there's there's a set of primary care services. We try to minimize the exclusions for operational efficiency. Um, um, however, the one difference we need to talk through is unlike MVP's model, we we where we directly pay the participating practices. Um, and in and, and the model with one care, there would be a fixed rate monthly that would go to one care and one care would then reimburse all of the practices downstream. Um, so we would need to talk through the mechanics of the model, the efficiency, the administrative um, tasks and, and make sure that we're not adding any unnecessary um, administrative burden uh, or, or extra delays in the information flow. Um, so what, what I'll share is, you know, our operations team at MVP, our strategy team, our network management teams are actively meeting with OneCare. In fact, the next meeting is on uh, on, on, on May 2nd um, and actively talking about how to move towards the fixed prospective payments. Um, you know, we have the exploration of 2024. We know that um, if you look at the bottom, there's some keys to really standing that up successfully. And we're also keenly listening to our colleagues at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and hearing their lessons learned as you try to move in that direction. Um, I will share with you that MVP philosophically would love to see this become a, a pure global capitation fixed perspective payment. Um, understanding that um, there may need to be some discussions around synthetic cap or, or um, reconciliation but ideally our ideal is to that 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 true global cap um, so that's what we're trying to strive for if philosophically um, in in those in those conversations um, we anticipate as we move through our agreement discussions with one care Vermont having a better understanding of the model and specs and targets and things this this um, late this summer, um, early fall, um, based on strategic alignment and operational feasibility. Um, so in the bottom, you know, key operational capabilities, and I think we heard um, these touched upon earlier, right? Flexible attribution. Um, and, and what we mean by that is not just the, the logic, but how the logic is coded into the reporting systems, into our claim system, all of those components so we understand how the attribution's working and we have a way um, in, in our model to learn as we move through this with the with the with the partners. And and as you all know, it gets more complicated when you're talking about hospital attribution, when you're talking about specialist attribution as opposed to primary care attribution. So that's where some of those flexibilities are key, and that's on our roadmap to continue to advance that. Um, 
I already mentioned analytics, high value care insights and analytics. It's so critical to having those more advanced analytics to support these types of models, to really support the providers that are moving in this direction. So we do it. We have the information together. Um, and I, I do think, again, it comes back to blending the claims data with the clinical data and the EHRs and how that information is available. I think I heard earlier, um, it's not, you know, the goal isn't to overburden providers with just reams of paper reports, right, where they sift through all the raw data, but to really think about what's truly actionable and what's important for the finance team, what's important for the clinical team and, you know, the quality folks versus care management, care coordination and on and on so that we get the right information to the right people in a way that it's trusted and and we're not reinventing the wheel to, to steal the phrase that I heard earlier. Um, and then operationalizing the fixed prospective payments. I don't want to oversimplify this. Um, this is something we're looking very carefully at. Um, as it relates to business processes, to systems work, to IT configuration, testing, all of those components. It's, it's not just the work on our side. It's the work on the provider side, too. So we're working through all of that to better understand what that plan would look like. And you can see on the right-hand side um, some considerations and, and, and barriers. Um, simplicity. You know, in our conversations and initial exploratory conversations around this, we're hearing – the administrative complexity and challenges um, and the expense um, is something that uh, providers are really thoughtful about as far as how this would work. Um, I think the other thing that we, we, we've we heard is, you know, buy-in as it relates to the perception of fair payments. So, you know, I think um, – uh, those of us uh, uh, on the payer side have been in meetings where you have our actuaries and actuaries representing the provider systems. And boy, those are fascinating conversations trying to get the actuaries to agree on on baseline assumptions, um, moving all the way through to those those more complicated calculations that you arrive at. So that's something we're trying to think through, and I don't have a magic answer to that, but how do we really work through that so that there's trust and, and in order to move to that true global cap? And I think it's trust, it's experience, you have to get started. Um, and then I've already touched on the operational readiness. So at this point, I'm going to hand the, the, the deck over to my colleague, Matthew McKinnon, to touch on the cost containment strategies. Matthew? Thanks, Scott. Good morning. Uh, again, this is uh, Matt McKinnon, Vice President of Network uh, for MVP. And one of the things under cost containment that MVP did about five years ago is we decided to join forces of network and medical. Dr. Marola, who's on this morning, him and I actually co-chair MVP's Total Medical Expense Committee. We have representation from all the departments of MVP with a focus on our cost containment cost containment strategies that will benefit our members can reduce premium dollars and so forth. So I'm just going to touch base on some of them for 2022 and what's in the pipeline coming, coming up. Uh, one of, and these are all specifically focused on uh, Vermont and the numbers that we're reporting here are, are specific Vermont savings. So one of the first ones we did was the termination of our agreement with Multiplan. We felt that um, the rental network wasn't getting the savings that we could get directly by either defaulting to fair health rates or actually doing direct negotiations for out-of-network services and determining if it is a provider that's treating a member on a regular basis, um, do we need to bring in plan and so forth. So, so reducing those um, network lending fees and so forth was over about a million dollar savings. The next one, next initiative we're working on is an implant pricing. We're actually going to have policies that update to limit implants to pay at invoice cost, and that's going to obtain us about $350,000 in savings. Um, what we've heard in the earlier presentation is always looking at our pharmacy. Uh, 2022 formulary ch changes will result in about $300,000 worth of savings, and you're actually going to see for 2023, we also have material changes that will get us over a million dollars projected. And just as an FYI, MVP 
We'll be going out to bid, um, looking at our pharmacy benefit manager for 2024. So we think that's going to be imperative over the next 18 months to really challenge our existing pharmacy benefit manager and see what else is available to the benefit of our members. You know, there's a real focus on the safety, the quality, the efficient utilization and the cost for the members when we when we look at all these various initiatives and approve at the committee level as to what is gonna be the impact, what is the impact of the member to our providers, our provider panel, et cetera. Last one is um, always ongoing on coding initiatives, you know, focus on evidence-based best practices. Um, how can we specifically look at updated policies, look at, uh, various uh, payment methodologies, inclusive services to primary services and so forth. So we have about 100, over $150,000 of savings um, for this category. And then on, in the pipeline, there was discussion earlier about lab management. One of the things MVP has done over the years, um, and, and I've overseen this with our lab management, is we have a very limited uh, lab panel. Uh, we, we definitely take a look at um, you know, especially uh, especially with COVID, a lot of these labs that have been popping up and really working in partnership with our labs that are currently contracted with us on, you know, again, quality of services and also steering utilization to get the price, best pricing and so forth. And one of the things we've done over the last few years is um, challenging panel testing and what's part of a panel testing and getting to the specifics. But we're also looking to move forward into lab management, uh, looking at Avalon as one of the uh, partners that we may move forward with. Uh, clinical editing, as I discussed, is a continued thing that we, we in combination with uh, medical, are always looking at, as well as coding and billing initiatives. So again, um, you know, G Dr. Morello, Jason, and I, um, really uh, get excited about chairing this committee, working with the other departments within the organization and be able to, uh, you know, share these cost containments uh, back to the members. And I believe that is all our slides, Scott. If you advance to the next, um, we'll definitely open it up now for uh, questions. Well, great, thank you very much. And for this round, we'll start with uh, board member Lunge. Robin. Great, thank you. Um, thanks so much for the update. It was great to hear about the work that you're doing, um, particularly around the primary care capitation model and with uh, One Care Vermont. I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit in the primary care model, if you've thought about or started working with the Blueprint for Health in order uh, to think about how your model interacts with both OneCare's model, but also uh, the Blueprint for Health, which is the state's advanced practice multi-payer uh, primary care initiative. Um, we, we, we have not had that direct conversation yet, Board Member Lunge. Um, however, I do actually have a note to talk to our colleague um, by the name of Carla Renders, who interfaces more with that program. Um, Carla Renders is also our point person on the One Care um, conversations. So I think uh, we will be sure to take a note and, and follow up to see if there's an opportunity. Great, thank you. Um, and I was also wondering if you could speak a little bit to the Medicare Advantage plan that you have started with UVM Health Network. Sure. Do you have a specific question? Um, I, well, we just haven't really had the opportunity to learn about the program from your perspective. And certainly we've heard, you know, read what we've read in the news and heard a little bit from UVM's perspective. But I'd just be interested in uh, your perspective on, um, you know, how why you as a company saw that as an opportunity and the role of Medicare Advantage in Vermont's uh, marketplace and also in healthcare reform. Yeah, so, so, you know, we feel that the Medicare Advantage um, plans complement and actually amplify the ongoing movement towards value-based care, um, you know, in transformation um, with those same aims of improving patient health and, and controlling costs. 
um, our our partnership um, w- was founded on those core values and principles that we spoke about earlier um, in earlier conversations uh, with the the health network. We talked about not-for-profit. We talked about our experience in Vermont as well as in New York. Um, we talked about our mutual goals um, to really have a successful launch and to really make – how can we make the biggest impact on on health? And and part of it is through as many covered lives as, as, as possible. Um, I think we're very much of, of like mind – that were very interested in uh, a, a, a payer and a provider aligned experience. And then early on in those conversations, we talked about our philosophies and, and they shared their philosophies and they were surprisingly similar. You know, when we started to talk about our missions and, and the health of the communities we serve and the opportunity with Medicare Advantage, um, and we looked at the, the the penetration of Medicare Advantage in the state of Vermont compared to to the rest of the nation. Um, so there's more opportunity in Vermont in, in Vermont with with lower penetration. Um, we looked at how could we have a differentiated experience that's really informed in by what they do well and what we do well. And having those candid, transparent conversations with you, with each other, we're very pleased with the with the launch where it where it where it target, um, you know. And um, now what we're looking at is how do we do the things we talked about to really enable um, impact and success as it relates to sharing information, as it relates to um, payer and provider collaboration around benefit design? How, how do we look at improving um, quality? How do we look at care management? We've talked about care management earlier. You know, the spirit of that conversation has been who's best equipped to truly manage the care of those patients. Now, I do want to acknowledge what Lou said. We, we do have to pay attention to the regulations and NCQA certification and all of those obligations. But we're trying to Think about new and innovative ways to do that to reduce that duplication. Um, um, so, just just wanted to share um, those those aspects. And you know, um, one one of the things that we're seeing as we look at net promoter scores and consumer experience in New York, because we have a deep um, Medicare Advantage history in New York, and we've seen very high net promoter scores for the seniors in New York. And we're very interested in bringing that experience to the Vermonters that are enrolling in that product. Thank you. Um, do you see a role, a complementary role uh, for ACO programs and Medicare Advantage programs working together? You know, I, I, I think it's, it, it's, Everyone is willing to do the hard work, right? To, to, to really um, move towards that risk and do things in an impactful way. We're trying to figure out a way to do so without really shocking the system. At a time, um, we're 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 still in the pandemic, unfortunately. Um, sure. And and I think, you know, where there's an opportunity is, One Care Vermont is a fantastic table an opportunity for collaboration. Um, and what, what I'll say is um, we, we want to think about how we can, um, as we bring in more lives, right, how do we bring in more accountable providers that are willing to share in that risk and participate in ways that we don't violate, you know, stark regulation, so on and so forth. But um, we're very open and interested in that. Thank you. Um, I'll leave my questions there. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll turn to board member Pelham. Tom. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions, uh, similar similarly to my question for uh, at Blue Cross Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield is um, on your slide 
oh, I think it was slide uh, seven, you have FPP explore in 2024. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have in mind as you uh, engage in this exploration, a, uh, a percentage of your payments uh, that, that, that you would need to achieve um, to get to 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 get the efficiencies that a fixed pro prospective payment is alleged to um, um, offer the system. I mean, is it thirty percent, fifty percent? What 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 would your target be? Uh, um, Member Pelham, I I can't speak to a target at this time, but we would be willing to take that back. Um, the information you shared when you posed that question was incredibly helpful and the first time I personally heard those numbers. Um, so I'd like to take that information back and think about that with our team and, and have a thoughtful response. Okay, thank you. And then this is a question that um, uh, always floats around in the back of my mind. And so I, I, uh, maybe there is no answer in this forum, but I, I'm going to ask it anyhow. Um, sometimes I wonder whether or not the, uh, you know, so so for the public payers, um, prices for procedures are are pretty well known. I mean, they're they're established and they apply across the board, but that's not true for the commercial payers. And uh, so our staff recently took a look using um, figures data and discharge data, you know, for I think it was like 60 procedures and the variation in in payments. To different providers um, uh, by, by by the different payers, and I'll just give you some examples. Um, you know, there is, and this these examples are from a couple of people that have complained about um, what they get paid. But for the procedure was obstetrical ultrasound of fetus, and the Matri Healthcare for Women uh, were paid one hundred eighty four dollars for that procedure. Um, and the number of episodes here are statistically significant. In that case, it was 306. UVM Medical Center was paid $437. Central Vermont Medical Center was paid as a median. These are median numbers, median of $750, and Porter was paid $405. Um, similar variations for transvaginal ultrasound first trimester and traginal uh, transvaginal ultrasound and non-obstetric. For echocardiograms, um, the Champlain Valley Cardiologist uh, Associates were paid $322, and the UVM Medical Center was paid $2,166, Central Vermont, 1,948, and Porter, 1,541. And so I sometimes wonder whether or not these relationships that have between the, the commercial insurers and providers that have developed over time um, are are uh, are the status quo and glue that hold that system kind of in 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 relation with one another, and whether fixed pro and w whether the movement to fixed prospective payments might affect those. Uh, market-based relationships over procedure costs where there's such a wide variation um, uh, across them. Um, so I know that's not a well-framed question, but if, you know, but if you see where I'm getting at, it's, it's the, the public payers, it's all pretty known. Uh, for the private payers, you know, for the commercial payers, when we kind of look at the data, it's all over the place. And, uh, and to my sense, some of the complaints that people make seem valid to me. Matthew, would, Matthew you like to? would you like to? Yes, so, yeah, so I definitely definitely agree uh, with the statements made. And I do think over the next two years, as even MVP has, has developed our own department to start looking at the specific transparency, it is going to help get things in line. And we are actively, you know, through through our network, through our transparency department, even with our sales department and our, our um, clients, as far as our employers and brokers, you know, looking at how this transparency is going to allow us to educate our members better and take a look at how do we close the gap on that pricing 
differential. So I think there, you know, there's definitely going to be a lot more to come with that. And I know not a specific question, but it's something um, actually my boss and I, Carla Austin, the CFO, this is the one thing keeping us up at night is the transparency and, and making it. And we think it's to the benefit. We think it's definitely to the benefit of our of our members and something that we're going to be tackling, uh, you know, in, in the front line in the next, you know, 12 to 16 months. And, and we'll keep you posted on those efforts and how we can close those gaps. If I could just well, thank you for that. I, I suggest that you might want to go to our website and look at is the uh, name of the report is the uh, reimb reimbursement variation report. And it covers about 60 different procedures uh, in very uh, in detail uh, by by each of the payers, um, Medicare, Medicaid and and commercial payers. And it's just it's the kind of thing you look at and you say to yourself, how does this happen? You know, I mean, why why is this the way the world is right now? And uh, I don't have an answer for it, but I sometimes worry that these market based relationships that have developed over the year are a hindrance uh, to transitioning to reform. I so, those my, so those are my two questions and uh, uh, I'll, I'll pass it along to uh, the chair, I guess. And just real quick, Dr. Conan, did you want to add something from MVP? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm very aware of these um, uh, inequities as well because <clears throat> I've worked in private practice as a cardiologist and uh, I've worked as a hospital employed cardiologist and I think it's also a health equity issue because patients end up paying a portion of this. So I think this is a, a high priority. And even though we are in a, uh, an agreement with UVM, the UVM uh, Health Advantage Program is for all Vermonters. And it's the, the distribution of members is spread all around the state of Vermont and, of course, upstate New York. So I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I've seen it from, you know, now three viewpoints, private practice, uh, hospital employed practice and now uh, uh, working for a health plan. So I'm, I'm very interested in, in reading your report and, and any way that I can help to tackle this, I'm very interested. Well, I, I kind of, uh, when I first encountered this data, I kind of hit the road and talked to some of these. Uh, and most of them, the independent providers are at the low end of the payment scale. And it just, uh, you know, it breaks your heart that here's people that are doing what they think they what they want to do and doing it in good faith and you find these uh thousand percent more than thousand percent differentials in terms of what they get paid and it's uh i i'm just hoping that as we move through um a health care reform that somehow the fixed perspective payment system will will kind of level the landscape so thank you for that mm -hmm. Okay, next we'll turn to board member Holmes, Jessica. Great, thank you so much. And I think in the interest of time, we'll just ask a couple of questions. I know we're going way over. Um, so, but thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's nice to meet you all and see you all. Um, you, obviously you have a pretty strong footprint now in two states, You know, obviously both New York and Vermont, and you have experience in New York with various different um, value-based payment models. And I'm wondering what you see as the key criteria that in your experience, you've observed that providers or a network of providers through an ACO must have to successfully transition to a true risk-sharing value-based payment arra arrangement. Are there key uh, criteria that you see that they must have? It's a it's a great question, um, uh, Member Holmes. Um, you know, like our colleagues at at Blue Cross, uh, we've seen successful engagements programs and we've seen others we've learned from um and in fact some of our uh, greatest our lessons greatest learned lesson. came from our experience in in new york under that district model where the state had a very prescriptive percentage of arrangements and member lives and medicaid that had to be under a, a level one i'm using new york state's risk levels now a level one shared savings a level two shared risk and even they were trying to move toward that full global cap if they could in those 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 more innovative arrangements i i can tell you um that um there's there's some some three you know key criteria the first is really a commitment on both sides 
starting at the top at the executive level, but all the way being communicated and effectively brought all the way down. We've been more successful in the arrangements, you know, in quality and hitting total cost of care targets and so on and so forth, where we have very active um, joint operating committees where executives from both sides are committed and in conversations and participating and having those relationships and building that trust is, is, is so critical. Um, the other piece of it is going back to the data information analytics. You know, you really need to collaboratively work on that, not overwhelm them, but be as transparent as possible with the information. Um, when we're in risk arrangements, we're willing to share that claims data. And our ask in return is that they share that clinical data with us. And what we're trying to do is um, create a vehicle where we can marry that information, share that data, um, share it in the provider workflows to get those insights out so that we're not only um, giving a gaps in care for quality, for example, report. We're trying to figure out how do we serve that up in, in, in that pre-planning section of the EHR? How do we serve that up when that, when that member is going to be seen in that practice so they have the best opportunity to close that gap? How do we streamline the reporting back to HEDIS, you know, so that we're not sending an army of people to collect charts out of a practice and disrupt their practice? How do we make that information flow more efficiently? And how do we bring those um, total medical expense, those insights that Dr. Marola and, and, and Matthew were speaking about earlier, uh, and make them available to them? How do we partner on their initiatives, you know, where they're focused on improving quality and doing something innovative with care coordination. So it's that flexibility, that willingness to partner, that willingness to think about things in a disruptive new way and say, you know what, maybe they are better equipped to do this than we are. Let's figure that out and see if we can change that mindset to how we how we truly collaborate. So it's that trust, that executive commitment, it's that communication, it's working on the data and information in order to get that truly impactful you know we've seen arrangements where um that's happened and and it's really meaningful and deep like the u of r relationship that i spoke to um we've seen others where we entered into an arrangement you have quarterly reporting and sometimes the practice wins based on just risk changes in membership population alone for example with the medicaid roles and, and other times where they end up owing mvp but you, you really got to do the work. It's not the contract. That's just the starting point. You really got to do the work to move the dial and you need that commitment to do so. So, and the other thing that helps is when there's enough lives, enough of the um, mix where, for example, MVP is an important payer to them. And they're really willing to really dive into that as opposed to if we're number seven or eight on their list, um, you typically aren't going to have that same level of meaningful, deep relationship and commitment. Super helpful. I really appreciate that. And I'm just wondering, actually, aloud out here, but I wonder if um, that working group that might be gathering about care coordination might also gather and respond to, you know, some of the data sharing and how to optimize data sharing. Um, sounds like similar insights, you know, are needed, um, and you've, you've you've got a lot of lessons that you can share as well. So I don't know, Susan, I'll just throw that out at you. <laughs> um, so let me, my second question is, um, as you're moving towards more of these payment models that shift financial risk to the providers, which it looks like is on, you know, your trajectory is, is thinking about that. How do you then think about your own reserve needs going forward, right? So we always are clearly giving contributions to reserves to MVP and other insurers, but that's because the payers have the financial risk. Um, as you're shifting some of that pay, you know, that financial risk away, how do you think about your reserve needs? It's, it's a, it, it, it's a complicated topic, as you, as you know, member homes uh, uh, around the reserve requirements. In, in some ways, um, the reserve requirements uh, stifle and, and gate some of the speed at which we can innovate um, and, and enter into different types of arrangements. So, for example, I'll tell you, um, we were in conversations in, with a large system in New York a while back, um, pre-pandemic, um, talking about a joint venture 
um, like a true health plan joint venture. And one of the things that we were talking about is not only moving towards that global capitation, but how do they get involved in product risk and the actuarial risk? And are they willing to bring reserves and share in the reserve requirement with the health plan? And what we found is it requires a tremendous amount of education if you're entering into those types of conversations with a provider system, because that's not typically what they've had to think about, or at least in a different way than we have had to as, as payers. And, you know, we're open to those types of arrangements if, if, if provider systems are willing to truly go all the way to not just the MLR target risk, but to go all the way to product risk and to share in the reserve requirements as well as the the, the risk reward scenario. So we're open in, in, in to those types of conversations, but it is a complicated factor. I'm not, uh, you know, our, our, our CFO and, and our finance team would be better equipped to go a little bit deeper than that board member Holmes, but hopefully uh, I answered your question. Well, you did. And I just want to make sure that, you know, as we move towards these fixed perspective payment models that we're not, basically, you know, holding the payers are not holding risk. And then we're not all also asking, you know, risk reserves for the financial risk. And then the, the, the providers are also then asking for reserves for the financial risk that they have, right? Because that is going to add cost to the system. So well, we need to think about that as we're moving forward. Well, the, the, the true, in my opinion, this just Scott's opinion, the holy grail is you have pure alignment on the shared risk model as well as the product risk model in those ultimate scenarios. Um, that's where the, the boundaries between providers and payers start to blur. And, and you probably have seen some of the literature on what, what the, the, the term pay vider models. Um, so we're trying to think about Kaiser, Geisinger, those types of organizations and how do you arrive at that endpoint with, with all of the complications and challenges we've talked about thus far in the in the whole conversation. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. That's it for me, Kevin. Thanks, Jess. And I see that uh, Susan keeps popping on screen, so I, I will give myself the hook and not ask questions in order to try to get us back on uh, schedule. Um, so we'll next go to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the MVP presentation? And Cynthia Browning. Thank you. I would just say, uh, as a member of the public and uh, a customer, when I hear about aligning the payers and the providers, and I hear about the importance of trust between the payers and providers, I feel the need to remind you how important it is for the Vermonters to trust that situation because the patient has so much less expertise and information than either the payer or the provider, and they are very vulnerable. And just surveys doesn't cover it because by definition, we don't know what care we should have gotten. So I understand the evidence-based approaches and the quality monitoring, but I just would say that I'm a little skeptical when the payers and the providers are getting together that they will end up with reduced risk and higher savings at the expense of the people whose care should be coming first. So it's not a question, but I welcome a comment because I wasn't completely reassured by your presentation. Thank you. So thank you for 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 your 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 statement and it it's something that we 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 truly um you know think about which is that what we call the member experience and everything you shared is wrapped up in that that member experience um we at we at MVP do um take that member experience incredibly serious it's part of our core values we we do uh, what's called evidence-based innovation um, surveys where we 
do talk to our members in Vermont and in New York, where we get both qualitative and quantitative data information insights, including those types of concerns. So we can take that information as we think about our benefit design for the plans that we're offering. And the other part of this is in order for us to continue to be successful, no matter the level of collaboration with the providers, we have to offer competitive benefits and, and, and price that best serves the needs of those members or they're going to move to another competitive plan design. Um, so we're hypersensitive um, to your thoughts. We're taking the transparency incredibly seriously, as Matthew talked about earlier. We, 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 we're very serious about um, access concerns um, and helping our members navigate um, through that in partnership with those the provider systems and trying to make a more integrated, comprehensive approach. That said, um, your your comments and concerns are noted um, and and we appreciate your 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 skepticism and your thoughts as we think about how we can best serve Vermonters. Thank you. Okay. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none, I want to thank the team from uh, MVP. Um, it's been a great discussion and one that uh, could have gone much longer. And uh, I apologize that I wasn't a little bit more efficient with the uh, the team before you, but uh, it's hard to cut off uh, the discussion when it's uh, really uh, intriguing people. So thanks again, and, th and really uh, thank you for uh, all the efforts that you've made on uh, value-based care and, uh, you know, trying to uh, provide the, the, the best uh, product to uh, Vermonters. So thank you. Thank you. So with that, Susan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm going to provide to the board and to the public today an update on the wait times working group that was formed as a result of the FY23 hospital budget guidance. Thank you, Kara. Kara is going to put my slides up. I don't want to experience any technical glitches that we like we had this morning. So um, I should be brief, but I do want to take this time to update all of you. I'm just going to go through our progress to date, our charge. Um, at the end of this presentation, I want to hear from you board members on your priorities. Um, and let me just go through this presentation, but just keep that in mind as we're as I update you on what we've done to date. So this is the current language. Um, I'll just pull out the key parts of it. This language is included in our FY23 hospital budget guidance. As you recall, uh, we added this language after we heard from um, laws and hospitals about the administrative burden of collecting wait times. So we took this back. Um, you put in this language and we formed a wait times working group. The members of that group include VAS. They include the De Vermont Department of Financial Regulation, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, um, and other interested parties. The charge of, the of this working group is to determine alternative metrics for reporting wait times for the FY23 budget uh, by May 2nd of 2022, which is, if I recall, I think next Tuesday. Maybe it's Monday. Don't quote me on that. Um, and if we... This group cannot determine appropriate metrics for this group. Then the default is what is in the, was in is in the FY23 budget guidance, which is and I'll just read these because it's technical. That um, if the work group is unable to determine appropriate metrics, the hospital shall report the following for each hospital-owned practice, for each primary care and specialty care as well as the top five most frequent imaging procedures. Specifically, please report for each practice and imaging procedure, one, referral lag, 
the percentage of appointments scheduled within two days of referral, two, visit lag, the percentage of new patients seen within two weeks, one month, three months, and six months of their scheduling date. In each case, hospitals shall outline steps to resolve wait times. So you can go to the next slide, Kara. Um, before I get into these metrics that we've discussed, I want to report that the working group has met three times to date. We have another meeting scheduled on Thursday of this week, and we've discussed, discussed several options. Um, these are the things that we've talked about but are not moving forward at this point. Um, we first discussed the option of utilizing the secret shopper data from the wait times report that was um, released earlier this year, and we were told that we were unable to use that data for this purpose, so that came off the table. Um, we also talked about VA me measures, Veterans Affairs me measures. Um, you can see what they are. At this point, um, those are they're they're great measures. They're just highly complex and 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 just too much of an administrative burden in this shorter time. It's something that DFR might consider um, as they look at wait times in the future. And then we also heard from Vaz on a really a, a qualitative proposal, which we then um, you could see the questions there. Um, we've actually incorporated those into a DFR proposal. So on the next slide, Kara, um, these are the metrics that are on the table. And I just want to say out loud for, I know the board is aware of this, but just to bring the public along too, the Department of Financial Regulation will is starting their process in looking at wait times. It's it, it was a recommendation out of the wait times report, and they've been very, very good partners in this work um, with us to look at the wait times for this for this year's hospital budget guidance and want to make sure that what we do land on in terms of our hospital budget guidance, whether it's the def the um, default measures or something we agree to in these in this working group, is that they will utilize that in their work going forward over the next years in developing um, wait times metrics that they will transparently report out. So the metrics that we have on the table now are the uh, Institute for Health Improvement, IHI, third next available appointment. It's a standard that um, we've collected it in the past. We've heard from providers that it's not always the most accurate representation for consumers, so it's not perfect, but it's still on the table. And then I... Um, alluded to this earlier, the Department of Financial Regulation has a proposal on the table, um, and it is both a quantitative, with quantitative questions, and also has a qualitative assessment section. Um, they are, we are, as a group, have asked them, and, and the Green Mountain Care Board has worked with them, to put together some survey um, questions, and that would really focus on some of the, the quantitative questions that we feel um, uh, that needs to be part of the, that assessment. So we'll hear from DFR at our working group on Thursday, and I can, I'm happy to report that back to all of you. I, it's just not ready for prime time today, but the working group has seen the initial draft and they are working on an updated draft to include those survey questions as part of their proposal. So the next steps are, as I mentioned, we'll have our meeting this Thursday, which will be our last meeting since we are um, to report back to you on the on, on our on what we decide if if we can come to a determination of other metrics, and then um, if needed, we can bring this up again next Wednesday to update you and the public. So I think there's one more slide. Great. So I'm going to turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, and to your board members 
what I really would like to hear from all of you is your priorities on these wait time metrics as we are finalizing this working group. I wanted to check back in with all of you to hear your thoughts. So what would be really helpful is to hear thoughts from um, board members Lunge and Pelham. Um, Jessica has been in on this group uh, from the beginning and um, has um, weighed in quite heavily. Um, Tom is our other designee, Tom Walsh, um, but he is out this week, so I'm pinch inning for him and filled in at the uh, meeting earlier this week and we'll be filling in for him again tomorrow. So it would be really helpful if Jess and I knew what um, you were thinking, Robin and Tom. <laughs> Sure, I can go ahead and jump in unless you want to, Tom. Um, <laughs> go ahead and jump in. I'll, I'll be close behind you. Okay. Um, so I I feel flexible and trust um, the you know whatever decisions that you two come to in the work group. Um, I do think it's important to have some sort of quantitative metric. Um, so, uh, you know, and certainly we've used third next available in the past. So if that makes the most sense to, uh, you all, uh, I'm totally fine with that. So I, I'm not going to get stuck on anything particularly specific, but I do think having some sort of quantitative metric is important. And then I would, uh, certainly qualitative information is always helpful to give the picture behind the numbers, but I would um, support, you know, whatever uh, makes sense in the in the greater context of what's being discussed. So I don't know how helpful that is <laughs> because I do feel pretty flexible, but um, and but, you know, you guys are in the thick of it with the everyone else in the group. So I think it's a little bit hard not being involved to to be too, you know, for at least for me, to be too, like, wedded to any one thing. Yeah, just uh, for further information, um, I think most people agree that uh, Third Next Available um, has its faults, but one of the pushes has been from um, what I would call not so much smaller, but yeah, kind of smaller hospitals in Vermont that they don't have the capacity to do what we're really looking for with their information systems. So that's where the push for the uh, third next is uh, coming from. I do think that uh, UVM for those three hospitals with the EPIC system could do um, the more detailed information as far as referral lag, visitation lag, et cetera. Um, and uh, going into this, I had wanted consistency so that everybody was reporting the same way, but I'm not so sure if we're going to get that at the end of the day, uh, or we'll get information that may not be as helpful as um, one would like. So, Well, my take on this is, um, and, and it's from a distance, is that it's not a perfect world and, and sometimes you don't get everything you want. And um, as I look back on this wait times issue, you know, I, I think the DFR uh, has handled it responsibly, um, maybe not perfectly in terms of the shopper report and some of the statistical anomalies they worried about. But I think that, you know, at least as a board member working with other board members, that, that you have a strong sense of trying to minimize the administrative burden on hospitals but at the same time, getting information that's usable. And, and that does mean information beyond just qualitative. And uh, so I, I trust your judgments to, you know, to um, find that balance. And I'm pretty certain that I'd agree with whatever, you, whatever decision you, uh, that you make. May I ask the question here, Kevin? Go ahead. Um, so the trade-off might be, as, as Kevin mentioned, consistency. So there are some hospitals that are probably able to, and I think the health network might be one, so that would be three hospitals, that might be able to provide the information that we asked for in terms of referral lag and um, 
you know, scheduling lag and the distribution of, you know, two weeks, one month, three months, six months, which I think is is more meaningful data um, and is particularly in the scheduling um, piece of it is more reflective of the true patient experience than third next available. Um, so would a outcome that would be uh, you'd be amenable to would be those hospitals that can provide the data in the way that was requested should do so. And those hospitals that can't, you know, tell us why and give us the data that they are already collecting, which is most likely to be third next available appointment um, and any benchmarks that they're using um, to benchmark their wait times against. Would that be uh, amenable to all of you if we were to propose that? Because that it does... Kevin, to your point, that's not going to be then necessarily consistent across hospitals, but it may be more meaningful for the hospitals that are able to provide the data as we originally asked for it. I mean, to me, it sounds like a practical solution. I mean, the, the network hospitals are 62% of the pie. And so it's it's not like it's three hospitals versus uh, the other 11. Um, you know, what the network can do because they've got a great amount of resources with um, with Epic, you know, we should leverage that and then work with the hospital, other hospitals to do as best as they can do with what they have to work. And that, that to me is is uh, equitable. Um, it might be different, but that because of Epic, you, the network can do something better probably than the other hospitals, but it still would mean that they're both doing the best they can. And we did receive a proposal from Vaz that was forwarded to uh, all members of the board. Maybe, Susan, you could make sure that gets posted to our website so the public could see that as well. Sure. Thank you. This is helpful. It is helpful. And um, it is um, at the noon hour. So why don't we... Um, recess the meeting here and come back at uh, one o'clock um, nourished and uh, ready to uh, go for this afternoon. So I'll put this meeting in recess till one o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>